the queen is dead. Long live the king. Um, welcome to another episode of the what? pennant podcast, episode three. Yeah, I guess that's what we're calling it, right? Tentatively. Yeah, we might change it. Maybe. Later. We'll see. But it's a nice not about that. No. Um, we. How do we even put into words the past couple of days? We're recording this on. Well, now it's Saturday, September tenth. Technically, twelve twenty four a.m. It's Friday night, man. Come yeah, on. Friday night, and while most people are out, you know, partying, getting lit, we're mourning Her Majesty, and we're mourning. Not a tragic, but a devastating, sudden, debilitating, dramatic end mm. to the great Elizabethan era that we have lived in since 1952. And 70 years? Yeah. And the thing that really um, ties, kind of brings home the fact that this is the Elizabethan era is like a couple screenshots that I sent Alex. But how basically people put two and two together and realize that Elizabeth I, her reign ended on September 7th in the 1500s, and Elizabeth II's reign ended on September 8th. So Elizabeth I of England, date of death, or is this her date of birth? Okay, interesting. So yeah, Elizabeth I's date of birth was September 7, 1533. Queen Elizabeth II's date of death, September 8, 2022. Interesting. Yeah. So she died the day after the last Elizabethan era pretty much began. Yeah. So poetic, you know. You could even look at the 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 um, the Platinum Jubilee this year, seven years on the throne, longest reigning. Monarch in Britain, second longest reigning monarch in world history behind Louis the whatever team, <laughs> you know, no disrespect to him. But, um, and the fact that like, you know, she'd been so frail after her husband, Prince Philip died in 2021 in the midst of COVID. And the fact that she kept g going on for as long as she did. And the fact that she made it to the Jubilee or the Jubilee is like they call it in the UK and like, it was a magical time, even though she only appeared like a few times, twice on that balcony. And I remember at the time watching it live, people were saying, you know, it felt like a goodbye. Mm. But none of us wanted to believe it at the time. I didn't want to believe it. You know, I'm like, um, you know, let's get a few more good years. Maybe she get to 100. But she was here for as long as she needed to be. You know what I mean? And like... Like, with this has probably been said a million times. It's cliche at this point, but I love one of my favorite kind of quotes from her is the one that she made before when she was Princess Elizabeth in South Africa in, like, the late 40s where she's like, you know, she'll dedicate her whole life, whether long or short, to her service. And um, she kept that promise. People doubted her. They're like, oh, maybe she'll, you know, stand down and abdicate or do a soft abdication and let Charles take over most of it. And Charles was taking on a lot towards the end. Like he opened up Parliament. He was doing a lot for her, you know. But she was doing her duty till the end, you know. She saw the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, the new Prime Minister, her 15th day, a couple days before she died. Like, you know, she kept it going till the end. And her son, the new King Charles III, He's keeping that legacy going by saying he will, he's basically intending to serve for life as too, life as well. And that's the thing about the monarchy is people think, oh, you get the castles, the glitz, the glamour, the jewels. But really, it's a life sentence. Yeah, you have no time to enjoy any of that stuff. Yeah. You, you have it as a function of state, uh, entertaining foreign dignitaries and foreign heads of state etc. So sure, it's nice to live in Champagne Castle or whatever, but if you constantly have important foreign visitors and constitutional responsibilities, you're advising prime ministers throughout the Commonwealth, you're keeping the Commonwealth together in yeah. Elizabeth's case, where the Commonwealth really became her kind of cause celebre as, as monarch and I think is kind of her lasting legacy. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see if the Commonwealth kind of idea maintains cohesion uh, now that she's passed and now that we're in a new era. And uh, yeah, 
Yeah, before we get to like, you know, what happens, can they keep the Commonwealth together, the monarchy? What was your kind of initial reaction to the news? So pretty much like the play-by-play for the people who weren't um, list paying attention is they initially announced that the queen was, um, she was going, she was experiencing like some sort of medical emergency. Royal family gathers at Balmoral amid concerns for the queen's health. And like I saved a lot of these um, these posts as screenshots. See, like they they switch it to the queen dies at ninety six. Well, let me pull up the the screenshots. But while I'm doing that, what was your kind of initial, you know? Well, I, I wasn't surprised. I mean, obviously, she was ninety six, almost ninety seven, and I personally have been. This is going to sound bad, but I've been kind of waiting for it for a few years now, just because it's one of those things that you know is around the corner and that once it happens, we're going to be thrust into a certain degree of constitutional uncertainty. Uh, the status quo of 70 years will be discarded and, and something new will be presumably built in its place. Um, and, you know, at, at the same time, there's co- continuity, obviously. It's the whole point of monarchic succession. And Charles, to his credit, uh, seems to be um, able thus far uh, his uh, statement, a uh, 10 minute statement uh, that aired on the BBC, I believe, yeah, um, was very, very regal and dignified. Um, it was a very good step in the right direction for those who have been concerned by Charles' um, political involvement and kind of uh, personal causes and whatnot in the past. Um, obviously, there's going to be people who are, you know, maybe concerned about his involvement with the World Economic Forum yeah. or um, the Paris Ag- uh, Accord and, yeah. and so on. Um, but for all those people who are worried that, you know, Charles would kind of degrade the institution's symbolic power by engaging in the vulgarities of petty common electoral politics, uh, Charles has been doing a very good job of uh, putting those fears to rest for now. And that's not to say that they won't reemerge later and that, you know, maybe Charles goes on some crazy crusade or something at some point. But uh, right now, it's, it's business as usual. Everybody's mourning the queen, uh, except for those who are making a point on social media about yeah. exactly how much they are not mourning They're the queen. Smoking on that, that Queen Elizabeth pack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Backwards, you know. Um, yeah, we, we can get to that, yeah. And yeah, Charles's speech, I like that you brought it up because we had just watched it before we started recording and like you didn't see World Economic Forum, Green Thumb, Talks to Plants, kind of He mentioned that stuff a little bit. He said something along the lines of that work is important, but I've left it in trusted hands. Exactly, yeah. Talking about how he can't patronize as many charities now that he has like kingly responsibilities, you know? Yeah. And literally, because like the moment she died... And when I first heard King Charles III, you know what I mean? Or saw that in the news article, I'm like, wait, what? You know what I mean? It just didn't seem right. Like even seeing King Charles now feels a bit, I'm slowly getting used to it. But at the time yesterday, I was so distraught. Like I wasn't crying or anything, but like I was just like, I just felt this heaviness in my soul. Mm. Even the idea of like, I went on Wikipedia this morning because I usually like to do that when like monarchs or presidents change, you know what I mean? Just to see it type in who's the head of state of England and like Prince Char- King Charles comes up, you know, and going on the God Save the King page yep. and it used to be God Save the Queen like a day ago, you know what I mean? Like, That's so crazy. Yeah. So. It's the little things, you know, because as I just said, I've been expecting this for years, yeah. frankly. And now that it's finally happened, God Save the King doesn't sound any less weird to me. Yeah. Literally, I was thinking, like, you know, the James Bond book, probably the best James Bond book slash movie on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Yes, with George Lazenby. If it was written today, if it came out today, it would be on, on His, his Majesty. Majesty. And it just, it sounds less romantic. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it sounds less, you know, even in, like, there's yeah. a scene in the movie. I recommend everyone watch. We got to review that movie. I want to do the other Such a classic. Something. But um, there's one point where Bond is drinking in his office. And there's a picture of like the queen, like the real queen, Elizabeth, from like 1969 or whatever. And like he toasts a drink to her and to her, and he's like, sorry, mom. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're drinking on the job, you know what I mean? Like, it's like that reverence that they had to her, that we all had to her, 
at least me talking from personal experience of literally she was the mother of a nation of hundreds, several nations, almost the world to a degree. You yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely the Anglosphere kind of world and the people that it's touched, you know? And ironically, people outside the Anglosphere seem even more fascinated by her and hence the, the tourism and, and so on that the monarchy drives in the UK. A lot of people, uh, you know, from the Arab world or uh, Asia or elsewhere, they go to London because they want to see Buckingham Palace. And, yeah. You know, they want a little taste of that uh, monarchic nectar, I guess. Yeah. So with King Charles's speech, um, he seemed like a king for the first time. You know what I mean? And this yes. afternoon, I didn't get to watch it when it was broadcast live. <coughs> but oh my goodness, I hope that didn't blow out your eardrums. <laughs> We're still oh my mic, goodness, so we'll yeah. see. Um, it's allergy season. But um, he had um, pulled up to Buckingham Palace, and there's a huge crowd gathering, and people were, you know, behind the barricades, kind of, you know, reaching out to shake his hand. And just, it didn't feel like a somber occasion. People mm. were as fanatic over Charles as they were the Queen or Diana or any of the, or Will or Kate. Right. You know what I mean? He was, people came to see their king, where usually Charles has the reputation of when he was with Diana. People would be like, you know, if they were on, if Diana and Charles were working like opposite sides of the line, people on the Charles side would get mad that they weren't on the Diana side. Mm. You know what I mean? And even now, people were like, oh, William should get the crown. He's always been passed off by someone. Yeah. But in his mother's death, it seems like he's truly taken the spotlight that he's waited so long for. This one lady like even kissed him. She was like, can I kiss you? You know what I mean? And she planted one on his cheek. You know what I mean? Like, I've never seen that level of affection towards Charles, King Charles. No, me neither. You know? Me neither. I, ironically, by the queen dying, uh, her death kind of humanized him. 100%. And his ability, you know, to come out with his face looking just a little bit ruddy and yeah. l l like he was having an emotional day, but he was still obviously held it together and, and so on. I think people see that and they see a, a human being who just lost a family member rather than, oh, that dastardly Charles who got up to this and that in the yeah. 1980s. That's the cetera. thing, yeah. And it's like, for the first time, he seemed regal. Like, I could see mm. traces of the older he got, the more he looked like his mother. Yeah. I mean, I see his mother in him, but also especially for the first time, I saw, like, his grandfather, King George. Yeah. There were definitely Georgian vibes from you that speech, I mean? for sure. With the dark suit and the dark tie and the checkered, like, pocket square. And, like, he just, he he's a different person. Or he's the person that he always was, but we never knew. You know what I mean? Because everyone who's talked to him, who's met him, says that he's extremely personable. You know what I mean? Easy to talk to, easy going. And he was always very sensitive, you know, from when he was a child, right? Like, the crown depicts him going to, like, the Gordonston whatever it's called, Academy, that was supposed to like toughen you up, make you a man. And I felt that was one of the first times Charles was really humanized for me because it's like just that quote unquote toxic masculinity mm. TM that he had to endure. You felt for him, you know, having to live up to his dad's expectations of what a man's man is. And he just wanted to like be an actor and mm, read poetry yeah. and, you know, learn Welsh and all this, all these hoity toity academic pursuits. You know so I mean? you can see how he became a climate change activist. Exactly. It's kind of a, a well-trodden pipeline at this point. Yeah, but I think it generally comes from a place of empathy. Like, I think yeah. this idea no, I agree. that the royals are just these lizard-eating kind of <laughs> people. Like, maybe some aspect of that is true, I don't know. But, like, I think this whole process, this whole year, the whole past couple of years has really humanized them, particularly Charles in my eyes, where it's like, He's just a person. He's just a son. You yeah. know what I mean? He's just that boy who wants to impress his his mama. You know what I mean? Mm. And like, I don't know, man. Something tells me that he will surprise us as king. You know, sure, there'll be gaffes, blunders, or whatever. You know what I mean? Scandals, like they're a scandal-generating machine. I don't think that will change. But something tells me that this will be a very different kind of Charles what do you think do you think he'll be able to I guess the main thing is politics how involved do you think the king will be in 
at least outwardly. I hope not. I, but I think he knows better than that. And he yeah. has been interviewed in the past. And uh, he was asked, I think, by a BBC presenter or something, uh, you know, do you plan on carrying out some of this work when you're... Uh, if and when, you know, and he yeah. said, no, I'm not that stupid. Yeah. Like he kind of knew it was always a part-time gig until he got his birthright. Yeah. Um, so hopefully he sticks to that. Yeah. I hope he doesn't have his moment where he's like, oh, wait, no, I'm the king. I can do whatever I want. I'm yeah. just going to change all of these off. norms, you know? Yeah. Uh, hopefully not. Um, so hopefully he surprises us by not surprising us, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is, all, as always, it's about constitutionality. It's about continuity. It's about business as usual. Um, and I hope he's going to bring us all of that stuff. And certainly his team should know to bring us all of that stuff like the people around yeah. him as advisors and secretaries and communications persons and so on and, and i'm sure he's got his constitutional lawyers advising him every now and again oh, as well sure. and, the, and the stakes have never been higher literally oh, you know, the yes. survival like we've been saying this since fucking king george the sixth the queen's father that the survival of the monarchy hinged on the monarch you know yeah literally the abdication crisis you know what i mean edward the eighth abdicates the Queen's dad, George VI, literally saved the monarchy through his resolute service to the nation in World War II, you know, with the Queen Mother by her side, by his side. Queen Elizabeth oversaw the Commonwealth and just the disintegration of the British Empire and was still able to hold it back, hold it, hold it together, you know? And through decades of scandal and misery and pain, but also jubilation and just the greatest advancement in technology that we've seen in human history. You know what I mean? She oversaw all of that. And now in this post Queen Elizabeth world, where things are just so uncertain, there's, you know, wars, pandemics, you know what I mean? Energy crisis, inflation, like more than ever, people distrust these institutions. More than ever, the whole idea of republicanism, you know, just the, not even like Republicanism, even, even if you live in a Republic of the States, like the idea that people want to tear down these institutions for better or worse is stronger now. And it's like, I don't know, do you think he'll be able to, will it survive all oh, this, or, you know? And like, maybe let your, your position on the kind of monarchy kind of okay. be known with it. So the way I feel right now, and I specify that this is how I feel in the moment because this is subject to change, you know, as we get new evidence and, yeah. and so on. I'm willing to give Charles a chance for now. Yeah. Um, long term, am I a devoted monarchist or anything? No, but I understand a lot of the intellectual and constitutional and semiotic arguments in favor of monarchy, so I'm not necessarily chomping at the bit to get rid of it. I will say that for quite a while, my position officially, I suppose you could say, was what I'll call Elizabethan Republicanism, namely anti-monarchist but pro-queen. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that to me, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm willing to readopt that position if we're disappointed, mm -hmm. but I'm hoping that... Uh, Charles uh, does his duty and, and serves diligently and honorably uh, until it is William's turn. Mm -hmm. But let's not bury the, the lead here. And uh, of course, you know, the queen passing and the coronation, well, the coronation hasn't happened yet, but you know, the coming to the throne, ascendancy, I guess you could say, of Charles, that's the big story. But the newsy story here is Harry and Meghan. Oh, shit. They've yeah. once again managed to make it about them, kind yes, of. Yes, yeah. Oh my God, yeah. So pretty much like there is this Forbes article talking about how King Charles names Will and Kate the Prince and Princess of Wales. So even Forbes kind of barely buried the lead in this head headline. And they basically talk about how like, you know, the Prince and Princess of Wales, it's the name for the heir apparent and his spouse. Like Charles was the Prince of Wales for years. The last Princess of Wales was Diana. And when Camilla came into the picture, they gave her the Duchess of Cornwall because people felt like it was too soon with Diana, you know what I mean? So big thing, right? Of course, that's probably the headline, right? And so pretty much William is, they're simultaneously the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge because they were the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge before and the Duke of Cornwall and the Prince and Princess of Wales 
and their children are all expected to become princes and princesses of Cornwall and Cambridge, you know? And with that, um, William be- gains ownership over the, was it like the Duchy of Cornwall or what's it yeah. called? Yeah, yeah. That's what it's called? Yeah. And then Charles's wife, Camilla, is queen consort. That was a big scandal years for years in the past in the sense that people, there's this perception that the British public would never accept Camilla as a queen because of Diana. And you know what I mean? They I'm a big Camilla fan, you. though. I'm so oh, no. glad Camilla won in the end. No, I'm a much bigger Camilla, Camilla fan than, you know, we took, we were early on the Camilla pill. Yes, yes. Like, I'm saying here, Camilla did nothing wrong. Like, I agree. Adultery, sure, it's bad, but like, Camilla was an innocent third party. Come on. Anyways, we're not going to, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to litigate yeah, the, the f- form now defunct marriage season of the, four of the former crown. Prince of Wales. Yeah. Season four and five. Exactly. Of the crown, you know, you can watch that show on Netflix, but just as a person, like I've seen some of her events recent, you know, just footage and like the way she interacts with people, particularly kids, like she's just so genuine mm. and kind of, she reminds me a lot of like Barbara Bush. Yeah, you know I, I mean? see that too, sort actually. Sort of just yeah. like not into all the frills and the fuss, just like, you know, she just likes to smoke and like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Play cards. You know what I mean? Like, it's just that slight that little like Margaret streak. Yeah, exactly, you know? So I think Camilla will be a great queen consort, you know? But yeah, bearing the lead like we're doing right now, um, if you scroll down in this Forbes article, it says that... Um, Harry and Meghan will, where is it? Yes. So the children of Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, will now become Prince Archie and Princess Lilibet, Lilibet, who's named after the late Queen Elizabeth, becoming the sixth and seventh in line for the throne behind William, his three children, Harry. So this is crucial because part of the whole... Megxit thing was that you know after Megxit part of that the whole scandal was that his children weren't supposedly going to like inherit any sort of titles like they weren't really considered princesses or princesses right and the big beef was like people were focusing on the the Kate versus Meg beef because it's like oh cat fight did mm. did Megan did Kate make Megan cry? No, Megan says it was actually Kate who made her cry and all this other shit. You know, forget about that. The real beef was father and son, Charles versus Harry. They had apparently intense disagreements to the point where Harry said in the Oprah interview that they weren't even on speaking terms. Imagine the then heir to the throne not even on speaking terms with his son. That's big. That's you know massive, I mean? yeah. And now when he ascends to the throne, he's announcing that, yes, his estranged son, who doesn't even live in the UK, they live in fucking Los Angeles. Montecito, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like, they will be princesses, despite them not being roking, working royals. Charles is, is he, it's not even an olive branch, it's an olive tree. <laughs> Extending it across the pond to name his estranged son's heirs prince and princess, you know? Yeah. Like, what do you think about that basically ending, deading the beef? Well, I think it was great for the grandkids. Yeah. So from that perspective, because now the grandkids don't have to be telling the story their whole lives of, oh, we could have been royals. We could have been royals. Yeah, yeah. But then, you know, we got kind of jerked out of it by all these... uh, circumstances yeah. so they're they they're now right for life which you know good for them yeah um because the kids are innocent in this whole thing but i don't think it's fair to just give in to megan like this personally uh, yeah i wanted to bring up megan in the sense that you i think you mentioned yesterday that was that the onion who said was it babylon b who said the one day megan can't make it about herself who said that was that you or is that there was a there was a headline i'm drawing a blank here you said Although we will go back to the onion later. You said something about was it was either you or the Babylon Bee who said that like for once Megan can't make this day about herself. She still something. managed. How? 
Well, I mean, we're saying that, like, okay, substantially, like, yes, the oh, queen is dead, yes. Charles is king, etc. Yeah, yeah. But the story here yes. is still Megan and yes. her kids. Yeah. And good for the kids. I'm not, you know, good for them. I'm glad that they're going to have an opportunity to be royals if they want. And, you know, chances are they're going to be valley kids anyway. Yeah. So what do they care? Yeah. But it's nice for them. Um, but, yeah, I think it's... it's uh, too soon to squash the beef. It's it's negotiating with terrorists, <laughs> in my view. <laughs> Alex, <laughs> Megan, <laughs> Megan Markle equals terrorists. <laughs> okay, don't, don't do that to me. Now, now that is a bad faith clip yeah, edit right no, there. Joking. Please don't don't do me like that. Yeah, guys. I know, I know. <laughs> I know what you mean, and I think if listeners know what you mean. I think yeah. I hope so. So you think it's giving too much too soon? Yeah, I do. Really? So what? Should... But at the same time, it's understandable, right? Yeah. Because when are you going to have a better opportunity to quash the beef and move on? That's and... the thing. And so if, if like, anything, how much of this is the queen from beyond the grave? Like a lot of it. A lot of it. I feel like yeah. she's directed this whole outcome. Even the whole back in February, which seems like several lifetimes ago. It does. My know, God. We were in the midst For of many like reasons. convoy <laughs> yeah. season. Yeah. And then you get the statement from the queen saying like, you know, um, I'm excited for, you know, Camilla to be, you know, queen, consort, mm. you know, and that kind of just settled the debate, you know, and literally she was kind of setting the stage for, yes, Charles will be king, yes, Camilla will be queen, you know, get with the yeah. program, you know, that's the, that the transition officially began there back in February. Yeah. Because then everything kind of accelerated since then, you know. So I have no doubt in my mind that all of this protocol stuff in terms of titles, the fact that like Harry, I'm not Harry, um, Will and Kate were named Prince and Princess of Wales so quickly because I was reading from the world experts that, you know, that would take some time. They need a ceremony. And like, no, literally the day after the mom's dead, Prince and Princess of Wales, here you go. You know what I mean? Like, I think this is Her Majesty saying that, you know, she wanted a quick, speedy transition to, business to, as usual. You know what I mean? Yeah. To, to not leave any doubt. Yeah. And that's also to her credit, the fact that she would even know from like beyond the grave that like these questions need to be settled fast. Yeah. S- swiftly. You know what I mean? Because she was like, you know, probably the best PR mind in history, I think. Like wow. a lot of people like to kind of, especially the crown, they kind of hint at like the courtiers kind of pulling the strings, the men in like short pants you know what mm. i mean the bureaucrats you know whispering in her ear and all this shit but i feel like she was directing calling the shots you know what i mean yeah like down to a t she knew every little line of protocol every ceremony she knew every song that would play every morning you know what i mean for this event or that event you know what i mean she was very detailed oriented. well she was steeped in the constitutional history of her country yes and she uh was so steeped for 70 years as as queen exactly that's a hell of a long time to learn all of these details and yeah. master them and refine them and think about what's going to be important important and if you think about it she lived through two successions yeah because there was uh well you know you have george v uh edward the eighth and then george the sixth mm-hmm. and uh all of that kind of happened uh within her lifetime that's true yeah so she, she would have been so she was cons. born in 1926 right yeah so she would have been 10 when the abdicate or nine nine about to turn 10 when the abdication happened yeah and um, she saw what it did to her dad it literally she said it literally killed her her father yeah and i'm sure it did being just the weight of being king that he just couldn't bear especially when he just wasn't that kind of guy yeah but he knew he had to rise to the occasion and be that kind of guy yeah and that's the thing it's like that line of the windsors george to elizabeth to charles i think they all kind of share that kind of sense of duty mm. were they are, like you said, they aren't that kind of guy. The queen wasn't that kind of woman. You no, know? she wasn't. But that's also what made her the best at it. Yeah. If she had been more of a Jackie Kennedy type, yes, it would, um, it would have been insufferable, frankly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And the world loves Jackie Kennedy, but would they have loved her as the Queen of England? I'm mm. not convinced. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Meghan Markle. Oh, you know well, I mean? exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, that's an excellent example. Yeah. There's a reason why they became the heir, you know, like, even though her dad was the spare, like, 
Mm. Anyways, yeah. So I guess can you blame Charles for kind of giving in to to Megan? No, no, I can't blame him. Honestly, it was the weight of the moment. It's a little bit of a shame, but what can you do? Whatever. Just patch it all over and then have a good relationship with the grandkids. Do you think that they're completely patched over? This is complete. Probably not. It's more. Uh, like but for... then again, like I have the Sussexes punched themselves out at this point because now Megan's doing her Spotify show where she's pretending to be Carl Jung, <laughs> and uh, yeah. I don't know what Harry's doing, saving the the whales or something. Mm-hmm. Um, no, you know, I guess he's doing his Invictus Games stuff yeah. and all that stuff. So you know, but they're they're busy, Netflix they're happy, deals, and they're making money. Spotify, so yeah. I don't think that they really need to keep rocking the boat. Yeah. I think. Megan rocked the boat enough to get the clout that she needed to make the serious LA money. You and think then, so? I'm just wondering if they'll continue to be even as outspoken, particularly Megan, about politics. Like, she was very outspoken mm. against Trump. Trump doesn't like her, you know what I mean? It's like, it's just unbecoming for the fucking, I guess, spouse of Harry who was, I don't know what in line he was, third, fourth, fifth, whatever. You know what I mean? I guess he was third in line before William had kids. Yeah, you know, like, it's unbecoming. You know what I mean? Yeah. The Duchess to be beefing with fucking U.S. president, you know? Oh, absolutely. Especially when the Queen actually had a very productive relationship with Trump, as far as we can tell. Yeah. They, they seem, seem to have good, gotten along very well. Yeah, he put out a very good message about the Queen and Charles, you know? He seems to like them both, so, you know, it literally is just Megan. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, Basically, Loki saying that I think he literally said Harry is whipped in one interview. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, um, no, it's, it's Piers Morgan too, right? Yeah. And don't get me wrong, Piers Morgan is definitely like to the left of Trump on a lot of issues, and yet he still had a huge feud with Meghan Markle after they were actually close personal friends for a while. Yeah. So. Mm. So, anyways, there's that aspect of royal titles and stuff. Um, I guess we could go to Canada, Justin Trudeau's um, speech. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Basically, the, the, the lines, she was one of my favorite people in the world. I miss her so. And visibly kind of shedding tears, you know what I mean? It was an excellent speech. Yeah. Um, I'd give it a 9 out of 10. Mm. Uh, for me to give JT a 9 out of 10 for anything is <laughs> almost unheard of. Yeah. Unfortunately, he um, does this thing where he dramatically pauses when he says words, particularly breathily. <laughs> and that drives me freaking insane. Yeah. And he definitely did that a lot during this speech, which is why I'm docking him his point. But he showed up in all black, you know, he got the black tie and gave a campaign speech. And yeah. he looked good and... It had gravitas, and you know, I, I, don't, I can't stand the guy, but he did a good job. And it was, if we are somehow still going to slip into a fall campaign, which I don't see happening at this point, I think most of that energy is probably dissipated by this point. But if that was a campaign speech, it was a damn good one. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he was able to deliver that two days before the conservative leadership race, yes. that's pretty good timing. Honestly, Don't you want that if you're a liberal prime minister? You give a nice, beautiful, yeah. pro-monarchy speech two days before the conservatives pick a new leader? Mm. You can't really beat that. Let's go off on that kind of aspect of it. Like, Okay. Let's say this is a campaign speech, effectively, and they do start to launch into a campaign. Because weren't you saying yesterday that like this almost screws over the conservatives, in a sense? It does. The timing. Yeah. You know? Because, they, okay, the most obvious way is the Tories would have gotten all this free press. New leader, yes. the unnecessary leadership race is over, yeah. blah, blah, blah. All that's out the window now because the CBC for the next two weeks is going to be queen, 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 queen. Yes. And any airtime that they would have grudgingly given the Conservatives... They don't have is, to anymore. Now they so don't have to. They've the been given a free media. pass. So the yeah. Liberal media wins big. Yeah. The Liberals win big. Yes. Um, JT gets to exploit his personal relationship with yes. her. Mikel Jean gets free to go airtime. on TV and yeah. tell stories about Pierre Polyev. We got to talk about that we have to talk about that yeah shall we just get that out of the way right now we saw a clip was it ctv or city CTV, news or something yeah, CT- ctv in, yeah so Mikel jean calls in and says that p 
Pierre Polyev sent a, a petition to directly to Queen Elizabeth to prevent Mikhail Jean from being governor general. Now, Mikhail Jean didn't specify why this was. Yeah. I suspect it's because her husband was a Parti Québécois guy. Mm -hmm. They were separatists. So Pierre, especially as a Western Canadian, objected to these separatist Quebecers yeah. being appointed the representative to the Queen. This picture would be like, your majesty, it is an outrage <laughs> that a separatist <laughs> would take the position of governor general. Oh, no. <laughs> I just jerked my lapel mic. Hopefully that didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We're still uh, still figuring this just out. Just in that nasally kind of Ben Shapiro pure <laughs> polyev yeah. tone. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, you know. It's just, it's a very pure, like, I believe it. It's it's crazy. It's ridiculous. Watch your cable, just yeah. FYI. But I 100% be, I believe that that, it's a very pure Polyev. Oh, move. it sounds so pure Polyev. Yeah. Like, I'm <laughs> not, yeah. I believe it. And the queen was like, um, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, not she, going to interfere in Canadian affairs. Yes, it would be inappropriate. That's what she told Mikel Jean, you know, so. No, that's what, well, yeah, but that's also what she told Pierre. Oh, really? She wrote back to him? I believe so. Okay, interesting. Yeah, but it's like the, I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> basically the, the, all the publicity, the, so you think, I guess, the post leader bump, it can, if he gets any, I think it will be negligible. Because the concern, well, concerns yeah. have already, if anything, the post leader bump has come before. They've been enjoying that for like six months. Yeah, so it, either way, I don't think and that again, will affect. And again, no disrespect at all to Leslie Lewis. Yeah. Who really could come one, two, or three. Yeah. But, so, you know, and might even win the popular vote. We'll probably beat Sheree in the popular vote. Yeah, yeah. So us, you know, we're doing the thing where we're talking about Polyev as yeah. a presumptive winner. Yeah. I mean, he is the presumptive winner, but no disrespect at all to Dr. Lewis. Yeah, this is all big assumptions. And I, I recommend people go on plugging my article on Les and Lewis can actually win. Yes, on, on pennant.inc. Yes. Uh, I'm very proud of that piece. I highly recommend that yes. piece. So if you're a Lewis stan, a Lewis truther, go read that. Even if you're not, Saturday. but you want to figure out why some people are, yes. read that piece. So yeah, no disrespect to her. If she wins this, then, you know, I'll be happy. Um, but presumptive leader Pierre, Pierre, probably definitely not getting any significant kind of post-leadership bump. Um, yeah, the coverage won't be there. So then Trudeau gets all this free coverage. He gets to go to, go to London. He gets to do the, you know, Jatem Papa kind of. Yeah, he gets whole, to talk about the 70s, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. Justin Trudeau's favorite thing to do. Talk about the 70s. So use that momentum from kind of, um, kind of, um, what's the word? Draping the flag. Mm. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like Trump hugging the flag. He gets yeah. to hug the queen's coffin. Yep. And then use that momentum to kind of rebrand the liberal image as the true defender of the faith which is like the monarchy yeah the true monarchist party and push that into like maybe a december election oh mama you know what i mean that's yeah. what i'm thinking like i'm not saying this is going to happen but if no I, was, I can see it if i, I can was see it. this yep that's what i would do just ride that wave of sympathy for the queen and mm. just not make any dumb statements because that's the thing if anything it saved them because the liberals were about to announce a bunch of different policy platforms you could say it's a setback but like i don't know all the stuff that they've been announcing recently like the lgbt 2l whatever funding Spending commitments yeah 100 million dollars that's just going to go nowhere also peter yeah. wrote a great article about that check yeah. it out pennant.inc it's just all these money like it's it's not doing anything it's not addressing inflation and anything right and the only way to get people's mind off of inflation is nostalgia. So if he becomes a nostalgia act, if he becomes literally like Paul McCartney, you know what I mean, Rolling Stones, mm. Kiss kind of thing, like Dad Rock, you That's know, what he is, Justin. though. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, remember when Gord Downey died and yes. he was wearing a leather jacket? Yeah. Like, he needs to, if he becomes Dad Rock, Justin, I can't believe I'm saying this, but he could eke out another one. <laughs> That's disgusting. I know, man. I hate and that. And yet conceivable. Yes. Disgusting yet conceivable. That would be a great title for a, the, the book, Retrospective of the Trudeau Era. So what do the peer conservatives need to, to do then? You know what I mean? 
because of the, yeah. of apparently like this queen thing throws a wrench into both parties plans because the liberals definitely had a bunch of like attack ads ready to go oh yeah you're right and now but they can't do that no as they much. can't unleash so it's kind of like a ceasefire it has to be a little bit of bipartisanship in yes. the morning period so what yeah. what would pierre, how how could pierre kind of game this Ooh. smartly like how would you if you were in the conservative <laughs> war room what are you doing other than obviously showing my strategy and, well like, yeah you, you know, p- so in the short term you play strong aside. defensive football you put yeah. politics aside yeah. you don't make any mistakes and yeah. you just say the right things and you know whatever medium term you go back to pocket book issues you go yeah. back to reminding people that the country is a garbage fire <laughs> and it's not getting any better yeah so they basically the conservatives need to mobilize people with a sense of real urgency mm. that there is some like an undercurrent of national catastrophe going on that has been afflicting us for years but particularly for two and a half years yeah and i i've said before on uh, on the site i i really do believe we have one more pandemic election in us yeah but this time i think the narrative is going to be a little different yeah and if the conservatives can ride that and ride pocketbook issues anti-lockdown anger um etc um run on the charter yes that you the know, queen helped that the queen and pet signed and ironically justin trounced made, he made one speech about it didn't he didn't he do the emergencies act and then like a couple weeks later oh he was god. like thank god for this charter <laughs> he i remember that i i have some sort of screenshot of jesus him. Like, man that's was, so tone it was deaf. the most shameless oh hearing him god. wax poetic about the charter on like the end of the 30th yeah 40th that's just shameful absolutely disgusting yeah so that's what pure needs to handle him yeah hammer him on you know so yeah kind of use the tory party like put the tory in tory put the tory in tory and so yeah pretty much this next election will be you know how much can we like you know what i mean like um for lack of a better word but fillet the queen's <laughs> yeah legacy. yeah no you're you're absolutely right <laughs> you, you gotta mean? put the queen's legacy front and center yes. and you gotta beat the freaking horse yes um that's definitely the way forward and that is also the way that pierre can fight justin's queen power yes. tm yeah um it's like you know when you're playing super mario and you get like those star power-ups mm, yeah like, you're right do, 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 you're right <laughs> that's the, queen the crown yeah. this is jt as mario picking up a crown and yeah. Going, do, 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 do. yeah yeah so it's just crazy man because like it's not like we're just gonna not be talking about this queen passing like five six seven eight nine months from now like it's going to be constant we're going to be bombarded the if, nostalgia tour is going to be big if you thought that you know you were overloaded with diana content from the last oh year God. or a couple years ago when the last scene of the crown came out and you had the princess diana musical and you had all mm. this material you know what i mean you had new books and you had you know what i mean like we were flooded with diana content you ain't seen nothing yet man it's going to be the queen all day every day for the next year <laughs> you know and every politician's going to want to get yeah they're be all like, going to want to get in on it's that it's like the whole you know you're no john kennedy movement a uh, moment right you know? yeah like it's get ready for it you know what I mean? everyone will say that they you know <laughs> <laughs> this man i have a good metaphor but like everyone's going to be saying that they had the pleasure of sniffing the queen's farts. I, I was gonna Let's say <laughs> like i'm trying to think of a word that's not jock sniffing but i can't it's you jock know, sniffing you know what that's I mean? what it is yeah they're every doing politician it. is gonna who has is in is a uh, like an inch away from a microphone will be but the queen you know I mean? okay this is very unprofessional of me but yeah. live without having done any research has jagmeet singh said anything about this yeah he has interesting he gave a it was okay statement he was talking about you know something that like he mentioned diversity inclusion at least once but like it was in a tasteful kind of way okay okay you know so I mean? he wasn't like ding dong the witch is dead no no he gave a very okay. good statement um the thing is also i wanted to bring up jagmeet because he the day before or the day he the 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 queen died i saw an, a headline i didn't actually read the article but i saw a headline that like jagmeet was going to make sure that he's going to basically push the liberals on on um fucking dental care and um what's the other thing he wants to do daycare 
Not daycare. Because Trudeau's already doing daycare. Fuck. I mean, Paul Martin was talking about this daycare program like 15 years ago. So. Yeah, Jamie saying Trudeau. But pretty much he's going to push them on their, their agreement, you know, because they have like a power sharing agreement or whatever you want. It's mm. a coalition that they don't want to call a coalition. But it's basically. It's a coalition in name only. It's yeah. a CINO. Or, or F. No, I have that backwards. But you know what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. Party will push government to act on dental care. It is a de facto coalition. Two days ago, this is September 7th, the day before the Queen died, um, calls on more support for nurses in healthcare amid healthcare crisis. He says he'll use the upcoming sitting in Parliament to push the Liberals to move on dental care and housing. Oh, housing, yeah. It's always housing. As laid out in the deal between the two parties. So, do you think that will actually happen? And now with this whole Queen mourning thing, how far, how much capital do you think Jagme will have to push. You know what I mean? Mm, that's a good point. And plus, how serious is he even in the first place? Like, like not? Yeah, because it's like, it's not like they're going to take their ball and they have nowhere to go. They have no money to fight an election, right? Like, yeah. So, but yeah, the, the political capital, if he, say he wanted to push, could he push as hard as he, he wanted to do on September 7th? <laughs> See, it's kind of up to whether or not the liberals feel like they're prepared to fight an election against Pierre Polyev. Like, yeah. that's kind of the calculus here. I think he, at least with the, with the type of announcements shrill has been doing. Oh, advance. it seems like they're getting ready for it. Yeah. It's almost like the, okay, I feel like what the liberals are doing is they're campaigning against the NDP, if that mm. makes sense. Mm, yeah. Like, they're sending signals of strength, like, look, we got this. Here's JT with a black tie yes. giving the best speech of his the, his best speech in 20 years. Literally, hundred, like, literally. Um, and, uh, you know, he's playing all the greatest hits. And what are you going to do about it, Jagmeet? Yeah. It's like regular season LeBron <laughs> for the past couple of years where he'll just be, like, fucking dropping, like, 40 Yeah, I'll just take game. 15 games off, whatever. Yeah, you know what I mean? Only to like <laughs> lose in the first round. Oh, of the yeah, that's <laughs> but like regular, where he's like going, like the past season, LeBron was like going off, right? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like he's trying to show that like he's still he's still the king. You know? Yeah, yeah, I know you're right. Like he, yeah, so. he was pushing for the MVP after the, the I almost called them the Liberals, the Lakers, <laughs> <laughs> basically got eliminated from the playoffs, and LeBron's yeah. still like popping off trying to get those MVP votes. Yeah, literally, that's Justin right now. That's just yeah, he's, he's just flexing on on the NDP. Yeah. honestly. So what do you do for the NDP war room? Like, what can you? Okay, do? what would I do if I were in the NDP war room? Yeah, for starters, I'd fire everyone and start again. <laughs> I feel like that's like a recurring joke between <laughs> us. <laughs> and and we've actually been in the NDP war yeah, room, to be we, clear. Yeah, but that's yeah. a long story. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, realistically, I don't know. I'd, I'd sniff Justin's jock if I were in the NDP war room. Mm, yeah. I shouldn't be doing it, but that's what I would be doing if I were in the NDP war room, because that's yeah. what people in the NDP war room these days tend to do. Yeah. So what would after that? <laughs> after, after that, the jock sniffing in the fire. I don't know. I haven't thought that far. You see, are they still paying me? <laughs> this is the the mind of a staffer right yeah. here. I'm I'm laying bare for everyone. It really is just from one crisis to the next. There's very little long term planning here. What I would do kind of ad hoc. It's try to offer some sort of alternative. Like I don't know. I guess the dental care and the housing is nice. But it's like... Is the housing nice, though? What do they actually want to do? I don't know. I really I, I have to be honest. Affordable housing is one of my pet peeves. And this is going to be super controversial because people are going to hear that. And they're going to be like, what? You don't think low-income people deserve to own homes? And no, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that affordable housing programs do not actually make housing more affordable like for rent controls, people. right? They create subsidized spots for some people that yeah. then distort the market and fuck over other poor people who aren't as lucky to be as high on the list as them. And yeah. then half the time they get welfare trapped into some place that they yeah. can't even leave. And if they get a raise or something at exactly, work, now they get yeah. gouged on the rent even more. Yeah. So it's a system of imperfect solutions. I would even say bad solutions chasing a slew of different problems. So every time anybody says, oh, we need to make housing more affordable, it's like, okay, what are you going to do to increase the supply of housing while yes. decreasing the demand of housing? Yeah. Oh, you want 500,000 immigrants per year? Mm. Well, that's not decreasing the demand of housing. Yeah. How are you going to increase the supply? Because the issue is, I've said it a million times, immigration can be okay 
if you are building enough units to handle it. And we are simply not. Mad Max is We're building 200,000 units for every 400,000 people that we immigrate. This is literally Maxine Bernie's platform. They call him like alt-right racist for it. Yeah. And for saying something that I, I'm hearing a lot of liberal people saying that, like on the R Canada subreddit. But it's subreddit, because they have no answer. They can only reach now. into the pejorative toolbox. No, and not the racist, racist part. The, 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 I'm seeing like libs on the Oh, Canada really? Subreddit. Libs are saying this. Yeah. Thing. Oh, my God. They're saying it's a supply issue and it's not meeting the demand of immigration now. Like the, yep. R, the Canada subreddit has been, it's low key. Not I don't know if it's full based, but like they're starting to kind of wake up and move. I don't know if it's well, being flooded by invaders who are center right or whatever, but like they're starting to wake up and realize that this whole lib globalist kind of this whole fantasy of world just, order build back yeah. battle thing is a bunch of shit. And yeah, wow. they're starting to wake up. Yeah. Well that's promising. That also explains why some polls seem to be giving Polyev like thirty nine percent right now. Yeah. It's weird the polling thing, because some polls you'll see him like, you know, like during, losing. Yeah, and other polls, you have these, quote, I call them suppression polls, where it's like, oh, most Canadians won't support a politician oh who, you know, spoke out in favor of the convoy. And, you know, our poll shows that, you know, Polyev is popular among hardcore conservatives, but centrist lib voters who would never vote conservative anyways won't vote for him. You know? Great. They're probably not going to so, vote for Jean Charest either because he's a dirty conservative. Yeah. It's a new kind of suppression poll every week that they've been pumping out. It's just so naked because literally I've seen the same headline copy and pasted. Popular among conservatives, unpopular among liberals. It's not true though. Like, if you see the... Anyway, I, I, the polls all disagree with each other. At the end of the day, you're believing one pollster over another. Yeah. And whatever, right? Yeah. But g genuinely, do you think the conservatives actually have any more of a chance by running a red or Tory? They've done that right twice. Now? They've done that a bunch well, of times before. You're, I guess you're right. Uh, Sheer... Andrew Shear is hard to say because I'd say the party were running as red Tories, yeah. but Shear was still kind of running as a conventional blue Tory. He just yeah. wasn't being that loud about it. O'Toole was like blood O'Toole red. O'Toole was like blood red. Like, Drek, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So anyways, back to Jagmeet saying, I, what I would do is I would at least pret pretend like I was going to leave Trudeau. Like, at least build, drive, yeah. drive up the rhetoric enough. At the very least, the thing is, he, he fucked himself over. And my mother even mentioned this. Like, she was the NDP, because she's voted NDP in the past. Like, I have. We both worked for them, right? And with my mom, she said Jamie was just completely done with her when he supported the Emergency Act. Wow. Tommy Douglas rolling his grave, you know? Yeah. He was the one who spoke out against the OG Emergencies Act, the War Measures Act in 69, <laughs> right? And That's that such happened, a good point. You know what I mean? And it's oh like, my God, the dude. NDP used to be the party of liberty and anti-big government. When I was growing up, the NDP was the party of civil liberties. And the Tories were the party of tough on crime. Literally, you yes. Know. Now it's the opposite, which is crazy. Well, I wouldn't call the NDP tough on crime, but certainly tough on political crime. Yes. You know, which is something that pains me greatly to say as a former New Democrat. They were literally like sponsor political crime. <laughs> they were all for it at one point. Jesus you know Christ, I mean? man. So, yeah. I don't know, man. It's just, it's going to be hard for him to pivot hard. But congratulations for not dancing on the Queen's grave. Because that yeah. must be a temptation when 100%. you're the leader of the current iteration of 100%. the NDP. Just be like, I'm dancing on the grave of this woman on behalf of all BIPOC people. You know. Can we talk about fucking... Yeah, sure. Let's the, go into that. The Bezos kind of... Do you have the original tweet? Uh, let me pull... Uh, Hold I on. Can't. Let me... It's on my phone, which is... Oh, yeah. Used. Your phone's there. Yeah. I forgot about it. Hold on. <laughs> I literally so, reached into my pocket. Let me let me just hold on a second. Let me like there's like a whole I have a whole archive of like people dancing on her grave. Okay. Smoking that Queen Elizabeth op pack. You okay, know good. I, mean? I like this archive. We should release it as a separate video like slideshow. That'd be perfect. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'll just give them a little taste of it, okay? Um Phoebe Bridgers, a musician, she said um, on Instagram, today we mourn all the stolen, violated, and traumatized lives who were affected and destroyed during Queen. She spelled Queen with Q, 
W E E N. Oh my god. Like gas queen? <laughs> like what, is this a gay bar? Like <laughs> come on guys. Queen Elizabeth II's reign. Today is a brutal reminder that war criminals will be honored while entire populations and societies bear the battle scars of colonial genocidal violence, invasion, religious persecution, and white supremacy. I don't think these are even her words. She retweeted not retweeted. She reposted a post from a oh pre- at rise, rise indigenous. indigenous. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean? There's a lot to unpack there. Well, we could start by talking about Queen Elizabeth's relationship with Canada's indigenous people in mm-hmm. an abstract sense. Now, yeah. I will say I actually know very little about her interactions with indigenous leaders in, in Canada and so on. Apparently so she had some nice interactions. I'm sure she did. She generally did. She was yeah. good at that sort of thing. Yeah. But um, so the crown. Okay, I hate to speak for like all indigenous people are like X or whatever because obviously no. But when you, you know when you're talking politics, you have to speak in kind of these generalities. And indigenous Canadians are split on the British monarchy issue yes. because land claim agreements were made or allegedly made or whatever the case may be in negotiation with the British crown. So if Canada abolished the monarchy and became a republic, a lot of indigenous groups would have a lot of trouble with their land claims, even more so than they're currently having. So a lot of indigenous Canadians and a lot of their you know, white liberal supporters who would um, possibly be anti-monarchy, okay, they'd be Republican maybe, if it wasn't for this, they want to perpetuate the monarchy indefinitely um, to allow these indigenous groups to continue pressing their land claims. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, however, you, then you have the other camp of indigenous people who um, see the queen as uh, synonymous with um, you know, col- colonialism and violence and, and, and whatnot, and they are looking at her more of from a perspective of what she represents symbolically in a long line of historical succession mm. rather than what she did as an individual person. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, again, I'm not here to say that anyone is right or wrong to believe any of those things. I just mean it's not an easy binary issue in Canada where you can simply say, oh, the monarchy is good for indigenous people. Oh, the monarchy is bad for indigenous people because there are people on all sides who will take all positions in this debate. Yeah. So it's murky. Yeah, and then the aspect of her statement where she talks about, well, I guess it's not her statement. I don't know, I'm confused. But um, the, per, the the aspect of the statement where it's like a war criminal, it's like, what wars? Like the Falklands? <laughs> That's all I got. The Suez Iraq? Canal crisis. Like, yeah, the Suez I crisis. I guess Iraq. But it's like well, there, there was Tony admittedly Blair. some dodgy shit going on during the Suez crisis. So I'm not just going to gloss over all but of like, British history. But it's like it's not like she was declaring I'm war. I'm usually the first person to criticize perfidious Albion. Okay, just so we're all clear. But it's not um, like she declared. She was literally the one declaring war. No, Thatcher should be the war criminal in this analogy. Or Tony Blair. Or Tony or, Blair. Yeah. Or George Bush. Or yeah. whomever. What does the Queen have to do with this? <laughs> Like, do they really think she can just wave her magic wand simply because she is the sovereign head of state in a symbolic capacity and prevent white phosphorus from being dropped on Baghdad or whatever? Like, come on, guys, get real. Yeah, I don't know. And I saw this comment on Reddit. It's not dunking on the queen, but defending her, where this person's called permanence is all, says, um, do any of these people realize England hasn't been an absolute monarchy for like 200 plus years. Like if the queen had said, dissolve all the colonies now, would Parliament have listened? Anyway, it's the dumbest, most obvious virtue signaling you could do and everyone seems to be doing it. (laughs) Black people Twitter is going off. That's another subreddit, but (laughs) you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I've seen different platforms. We don't have to get into it, you know, but particularly black American platforms talking about how Mm. like, you know, they're smoking on Lizzie. This is for all the colonized people. You know what I mean? I hope she's looking up at at us. (laughs) You know what I mean? Looking up at, wow. (laughs) You know, so I just... Stay classy, Twitter. Yeah. But the, 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 um... The Jeff Bezos one. Oh yeah, now this one was is interesting because so, normally we see Bezos as this woke terrorist, basically, but here he is, ironically, taking the like moderate position. So this person, I guess, they're a journalist, Uja Anya. 
You know anything? I'm not, I'm not familiar with them. She has. They have like a check mark. Whoever they are. Um, I heard. So Uja Anya says. I heard the chief monarch of a thieving, raping, genocidal empire is finally dying. Oh, Gorbachev. <laughs> I forgot that Gorbachev <laughs> died. Womp womp. <laughs> May her pain be excruciating. And then Jeff Bezos retweets there saying, this is someone supposedly working to make the world better. I don't think so. Wow. Good for Jeff. Evil billionaire Lex Luthor himself, Jeff Bezos. Is <laughs> Beginning to realize reason. that he can only buy the left for so long. The executive producer of the Rings of Power, <laughs> Jeff Bezos, is putting who I assume a woman of color in her place. <laughs> Make it make yeah. sense. Mr. Washington Post himself. Yeah, make it make sense. Yeah. What are you, like, you're the one who sent this to me. Like, <laughs> Honestly, it's a good sign for Bezos. Yeah. Because based Zos? Like, say? this is like based Zos' <laughs> Char- King Charles moment. Yeah, where he's yeah. like, yeah, I know I was Mr. WEF Paris Accords, but you know what? It's time to put the toys away now and yeah. become an adult. Maybe Bezos is having the same moment where he's like, you know, maybe I'm going a little bit too far, throwing all these billions of dollars at all these activists who hate me anyway. The first indication that he was kind of shifting was the rings of power thing where he was admitting that they might have. (laughs) Yeah, we may have gone too far on this one, guys. Yeah, so because apparently he was trying to give some some pointer some notes to the show but they wouldn't listen to him and like he literally is paying for this i don't know yeah it doesn't make isn't it like the most expensive show ever cost like a billion cost dollars. more than the crown really, ironically yes wow so it's i'm not gonna watch it i don't give a shit yeah but anyways it's interesting how much of this is elon musk you know kind of his influence yeah like y- you think bezos saw musk becoming more conservative and was like Maybe I can get away with the same thing. Yeah. Because it doesn't make sense why all these rich people are so tied with the Democrats when they're going to tax them more. Well, it's just, uh, what's the term? Uh, It's it's virtue signaling. Services rendered. You know, you know that the machine politicians are going to get the job done as long as you get the job done for them. And you know you're not going to pay it anyways. Yeah, exactly. You can hire an army of tax lawyers. It's middle America that's going to be paying those taxes. It's not yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Like, is maybe this is the beginning of a gradual desantisification of the American billionaire class. God can only hope. Mm. And then, um, let's see. I'll skip the Joe Biden <laughs> <laughs> Protestant pretender has been dealt with me. We need to do, like, a meme review. A, a Queen Elizabeth dies meme review <laughs> honestly it's um, it's probably a good thing that liz truss was pm for this and not bojo because yeah. bojo is a catholic now oh really he's a catholic yep what's liz truss's religion I'm she must assuming. be anglican i'm assuming mm. like every other british politician mm. so yeah to wrap up the, the the section of like i guess except tony blair who is a crypto catholic really officially converted after he was prime minister in my opinion, so as to not cause any constitutional crises. Damn. Okay. Yeah. But Bojo didn't give a fuck. He was just yeah. like, yeah, I'm going to knock up this Catholic girl. And then, oh, oh, I'm Catholic, suckers. Damn. So, yeah. What do you think about this just this phenomenon of dunking on the queen? Um, I understand it. And I know that there are people who genuinely feel that they're speaking from a position of moral authority. And I, I get it. Mm-hmm. But they're picking a bad target. Yeah. They should, like, there are better like, targets. Literally, oh, my goodness. Like, this meme, I don't know if the camera can see it. It's, it's we're just for audio <laughs> Diana, only Venom Diana dunking on Spider-Man Queen. Yeah, Elizabeth from yeah. the Grand Wizard Chattanooga Instagram page that I usually <laughs> love. Honestly, he had some, like, spicy takes on this, you know? But even he was taking the whole, like, yeah, let's dunk on the Queen. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like... It's easy content, you know what I mean? It's just why people our age, it seems like obviously if you school older, you're more likely to um, um, have some sort of reverence for the monarchy. Yeah, or like, just for traditions and institutions yeah, in general. Yeah, like my mother, she's not even like a monarchist in the slightest, you know what I mean? But she still has a level of like respect and reverence, whereas people our age and younger are just like, why the fuck should I care, you know what I my, mean? My like, grandmother was from rural Quebec. Yeah. So 
not necessarily plugged into the whole Anglosphere Commonwealth scene. Yeah, yeah. But she loved the Queen. She loved her class and her style. Yeah. And even though they did not share a language or a religion, because my grandmother was Catholic, mm -hmm. but um, uh, she still uh, really identified with her. So what is it? Is it just that this generation is more nihilistic? Yeah, well, because I'm I've even like some this like generation is UK so whack, man. YouTubers I follow, they were kind of like, you know, yeah, I don't give a fuck about Lizzie. You know what I mean? Because she's just another lizard person. You know what I mean? Like, like, I, like I get it, but like, like it, it could have right been wing, so much worse. You know? This is what these people are not realizing. Yeah. Like, what if uh, Prince Harry had been king for 70 years? <laughs> oh my God. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank God we avoided that. Or just send our dirt, or, or something. something like exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh my god! It could have been so much worse. It, so probably the most unprofessional thing I've done as a writer for Pennant, yeah, is refer to New Zealand as Jacinda Stan. Yeah, but I couldn't bring myself to edit it out. Yeah, so I just kept it. I didn't even question it. There we go. <laughs> I just associate that with New Zealand. At this point. That's what it is. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, like that's and that's basically what I was saying. Like I made a post on Instagram and I was like, hey, literally, she's the best monarch to ever walk the face of the earth. She's the goat. Yes. She's Serena Williams. She's Tiger Woods. Jordan. I don't know what you she's Jordan. It's indisputable. Tom Brady, like Yeah. She's monarchy at its best. Like, yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Like I'm working on a piece now for the pennant to kind of talk about kind of the pros, the benefits, her, the highlights, and like just the level of class. You know what I mean? Like best case scenario for like a 20th century, 21st century monarch, you know, modern era, like, like yeah, there's some stuff you could dunk on, but as a person in terms of the actual service of that role, I don't know, man. I don't think about colonialism and all that shit, you know? Because what does that have to do with her? Yeah. What does that even really have to do with any monarch? Because it's been hundreds of years since any of them were directly involved. Yeah. Uh, so it's all kind of apropos of nothing. But I'm going to jump on your Tom Brady comment for a second. Because mm. the Patriots had this saying, very simple, do your job. Yeah. Three Kobe, words, Kobe but very powerful. Phrase, job's not done. That, those two phrases to yeah. me embody Queen Elizabeth. She's the ultimate do your job. Yeah. She wasn't born to be queen, but she was born to be queen at the same exactly, time. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So uh, she always did her job and she always did it with a smile and with grace and class, even when that wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. And she was the right, right woman for the job. Yeah. Right woman at the right time. And I guess, I don't know if it was anything else to talk about other than like, I guess, the symbols and the logistics of the rain and the transition, like the coins kind of being changed over and the debate over whether or not um, King Charles should be on the on the 20, you know? No. You don't think so? Keep the queen on the 20. Hmm. When I, I die, okay, I don't want the queen on my on 20. 20. <laughs> oh my God, That's yo. Another meme we got. I don't know if you guys could see this, but someone, <laughs> for, for our audio only listeners, someone did a meme where they're like, my heart is canned right now, your money's about to get ugly, and they show this rather unflattering, unflattering Photoshop picture of King Charles. It's actually a really good shop, though. No, like, yeah, it, it looks, looks real, good. Yeah. Like, that looks like legal tender. <laughs> yeah, but they wouldn't I'm surprised use... it doesn't say, like, specimen. <laughs> well, they wouldn't use Imagine that trying like that. to pass that to, like, a gas station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's a new 20, man. <laughs> like, I don't know, man. No, keep, keep the queen on our currency forever. You think so? She's I don't like, think that's what we're going to do. I think we will get some Charles coins at some point. Like, yeah. let him have some commemorative stamps, commemorative coins. Give him something that he can put, you know, in some cabinet in his house mm. and enjoy. But uh, the queen on our money, I mean, it's iconic. Yeah. I've never seen anyone but the queen on Canadian currency. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you find the occasional penny from the 1940s or something. Yeah, with but, George, yeah. <laughs> And that's the thing, even though I was reading with George, like that money was in circulation for years, nearly a decade after he died. So I think it'll be similar with the Queen. It'll still be in circulation. Oh, the Queen will be in circulation for at least a decade. Yeah. And you're more likely to see Charles on the coins because that's easier to kind of... Right. Yeah. Meltdown and like, yeah. yeah. 
whereas the bill, it might be up in the air because at least the role expert I was reading about in the CBC, he was saying like the current government might be less might be more hesitant to put another straight white male on the tweet. Oh <laughs> my god. This is this one expert's interpretation. Uh, I hate to say it, but it I hope sense. he's right. You do? Yeah. I hope he's right. Because I don't want this particular straight white male on the currency either. But I don't want him to, I don't want either keep the queen or put Charles. I don't want to replace him with no disrespect to Terry Fox. But I've heard people suggest Terry Fox. Yeah, okay. But uh, again, gonna... straight white man. Yeah, but then who else? Like, we already have Vile Deus on the 10. I don't know who else. What other Canadian woman who's diverse enough? I don't know. Adrian Clarkson. <laughs> mm -hmm. I wouldn't want that either, but you oh, can make Julie an argument. Payet. No, definitely not Julie Payet. <laughs> yeah, maybe a decade ago. Um, Roberta Bondar. I don't know. Yeah, I could see Roberta Bondar. But no, it's like they're not the queen. <laughs> Yeah. Like the only suitable replacement for the queen is a king, like the king. Like, yes. You know what I mean? Yes. If they're going to replace it. Yes. You know? So I don't know. And then also like, you know, there's the, well, the God Save the King anthem we talked about. There's... That's weird. That just sounds weird to me. Mm. People have already been saying it. Well, they've been saying long live the king, God save the king, you know? So I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. The passports. Oh my god. Yeah. Are going to have to be changed from her. Any Pretty much any government document that says Her Majesty is going to have to be changed to His Majesty. His Majesty. Wow. Yeah. That can't be cheap. No, it can't be. Like, they're going to spend millions of pounds. Just to change the pronouns. And millions of dollars see, just this, changing pronouns See, this around. is where the gender neutral... <laughs> oh my god. Uh, this, this, is, this is actually a pretty good... <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, if there's a royal we, why can't there be a royal they? I uh, <laughs> Maybe. Also, the royal we should just be a pronoun. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm identifying as a sovereign today. Mm. I don't know. Hey, speaking, of, speaking of they, there is apparently, I forget, I wonder if I saved this. There's this member of the royal family who, I think they claim to be like the rightful heir through the house of Stuart. And like he's pretty much like uh, like a he came out as gay at like age eighty or something like that. He's like some like wow. duke living in like some European principality who's like, yeah, I'm the rightful heir to the throne through the house of Stuart. Well, and he happens to be gay. So and overly gay. They dug up Richard the Third's body in some parking garage yeah. a few years ago, and they did some DNA tests on it, and they found his descendant. Was just like some accountant or something in Australia. Yeah, there's a lot of weird stories like that. You know, so, all these yeah. people with claims, pretenders. You know what I mean? Or there's the guy who claims that uh, Princess Margaret, he was Princess Margaret's son. Yeah, he was adopted by that British family in Kenya. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's all kinds of people claiming to be pretenders to the throne one way or another through some link. And honestly, it's kind of cool. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you get to see the whole family tree. Do a whole episode on that. You we know? could do a whole episode on just like European royal incest. But anyway. Yeah. And yeah, do you think, I guess to sort of wrap this up, the whole um, abolishing the monarchy kind of debate, people have always said the cliche has always been once the queen dies... She literally was the levy holding the floodgates back. Well, well there, there's a Caribbean nation. I, I think it's Barbados. Barbados just left. Jamaica is about to leave. Because so, the Jamaican so, prime minister told, literally told Prince William to his face, like, we intend to become a republic, basically. Well, so why didn't we do that? What do you mean? So Canada, Canada's, we've been playing with the monarchy for a long time. You'll remember... Um, Stephen Harper was the one who came in and actually brought back the Royal Canadian Air Force, the Royal yeah. Canadian this and that, yeah. because we were just the Canadian forces before. Yeah. You know, we took all the royal stuff out. We kind of republicanized our yeah. country's institutions superficially, but we didn't do it constitutionally. Yeah. And then Harper came in and he reverted the changes. He and, put a picture of the Queen in Rideau Hall. Yeah. Yeah. So... What do you think? It's this. Well, there's obviously Canadians as a whole are not fully comfortable with the monarchy. 
Mm. But constitutionally, there's not much we can do. Yeah, you need like um, all the provinces to agree, pretty much. Yeah, and you, Quebec hasn't even signed the the first constitution or the, the the 1982 constitution. Right, and there was some. This was another kind of side story. I don't know if you saw this, where apparently there was this law on the books that fucking um, Rene Levesque, the former premier of Quebec, um, from the 80 referendum, put on saying that like if the queen were to die, then Quebec government will have to shut down like the Quebec legislature will pretty much cease to function Wow and then but then um, Legault passed a law in 2021 Kind of reverting that saying that the government of Quebec will continue in the Queen's death Wow, he was the only candidate to suspend campaigning in the Quebec election when the Queen died really the conservative party of Quebec didn't do it that's what that's what I read. I didn't actually investigate. Wow. That's what the source I read that he was the only one who suspended campaigning. Interesting. And people on Reddit were saying like this is actually a big progress because in '95, for those of you who don't know the history of Canadian, Le the Legault was a separatist sub- back then, right? I don't know. What I'm saying in '95, we the Canada literally came close to breaking up. You know what I mean? Actually, okay, I'm sorry. I, I have a funny anecdote about this. Yeah. So the referendum failed by, I think, 10,000 votes. Yeah. The Hells Angels supported Canadian federalism. Yeah, I remember you telling and me And they this. vandalized separatist posters <laughs> and probably beat up a few separatists here and there. And oh it's because God. the Angels were expanding into southern Ontario at the yeah. time. So Quebec separatism would have really fucked up their business interests. And arguably, without the Hell's Angels, Damn. Quebec would be a sovereign nation a today. On that, oh my God, that's pretty amazing. This is like a Kennedy winning fucking Chicago. Yeah, this is like yeah, like all of the all of the mob Sinatra ties. Sinatra calling in some favors with the mob in Chicago to kind of you know <laughs> get those electoral votes. You know? Yeah. Damn, that's crazy. But yeah, this country came so close to kind of breaking up, literally. Just like 95, I was like born. So 27 or take years ago to the point where the premier of Quebec passes a law to keep the government going in case of the queen's death. A premier who was basically a separatist for like a lot of his life, I believe. I believe with Francois Legault because CAC is kind of a weird party. Like they're like soft separatists but not really yeah like they support federalism but they still want fat cat status for big, quebec permanently the big thing was the quebec flag was half mast yeah that's per, that's actually pretty that's big actually deal. bigger than even the law itself. that'd be like flying the irish flag at half mast yes. or something maybe it did fly maybe it did mast. for all we know yeah, especially now flag, that we're dealing with new ireland joe biden flew the notable yeah. fake irish <laughs> joe biden yeah you know, flew the order the american flags we've flown half mast you know so this, it just shows you how big Elizabeth was, that she was bigger than Quebec separatism. Bigger than the War of Independence. <laughs> bigger than the fucking <laughs> war of not, what was Bigger the, than the IRA, arguably. The Battle for the Plains of Abraham, the Seven Years' War. Yeah, yes, yeah. You know what I mean? Which literally founded the country when the English beat the French and pretty much the French. That's in true. Canada we say 1867 is the beginning of Canada, but no, it's really, really it's 1750. Nine? Something like 56, whatever. 59? Google, well, whatever the Seven Years' War was, that's when the French effectively became a conquered people in Canada. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, conquered, but... Mm, they kept their language. They kind of got a good deal. The best deal that they could get. And yeah. And still, it's not good enough. <laughs> wow. Well, but anyways. I mean, my God. <laughs> yeah. But anyways. So it's like, that's just interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess back to the whole, we're jumping all over the place, man. This, Sorry, guys. This is this is raw. This is yeah. what it is, you know. But the mm-hmm. idea of republicanism in Canada, like, how strong do you think it will be? Is it entirely up to how Charles performs, or is it more of whatever the UK does will do? Because that's what I think. I agree. I don't think we'll end up abolishing it before the UK. (laughs) The sad thing is, technically, our link of being subordinate forever to the United Kingdom is through the monarchy. Yes. And yet, I actually don't think that matters. I think we the monarchy could disappear over vanish into the night and i think we would still be british subjects yeah, essentially yeah which is really sad um it's but just, i agree with you i think whatever british are just so does, wrapped up do. in it 
more so than like Barbados and all those other places where yeah. it's just it's easier to do like a clean a clean. Well, there they actually have an indigenous culture that's not like directly linked to British ancestry. Whereas exactly. in Canada, we never fully figured that out. We pretend to have figured that out. Yeah. But we never really figured that out. We kind of just got good at folding all of these people into our like predominant post-British culture of like Ukrainians and yeah. whoever else. Yeah, yeah. Where yeah, they have actual like culture culture, you know. Yeah. So yeah. That makes sense. Not saying that Canada doesn't have culture, but it's different. It's different. And yeah. it's more regional and it's maybe a little bit more ethnic. Like we don't really have a national unifying civic yeah. culture. I mean, oh, well, obviously. I mean, look at the state of national unity right now. It's a joke. But anyway. And then what about the UK? Because I was reading that or I was hearing that um, the Queen's approval rating was 75%. Charles was like 47. Ooh. It was actually kind of high, if you think about it, for Charles. Yeah, is but like anything under 50 is not great. No, it's not great. <laughs> it could be worse. It's not great. It's better than Joe Biden. Well, this is the best window to abolish the monarchy, if you think about it, because I'm not the biggest Prince William fan, but I'm not really a detractor either. Like, yeah. he's just boring, yeah. which is kind of what you want in a head yeah. of state. You yeah. want a boring head of state. He was very boring. Yeah, you're right, but she was also funny and stylish. No, that's and, true. Yeah, she had... But you're right. She had kind of a boring, somber personality. And that's a compliment coming from me because yeah. I'm extremely boring. So... <laughs> no, I think you're boring. Well, thank you. But uh, anyway. So um, the people who are watching us talk for like two hours or however long. <laughs> yeah, I guess hopefully we're not that boring. Yeah. But... Um, Right, this is the window. I don't think anyone's going to get worked up about go oh, King William and Queen Kate. No, mm. we got to, you know, yeah. move on. Charles is the window for for that. So well, if we're going to see an Elizabethan Republican Revolution, it's now or never. And I think never. I don't. I just don't. Unless it's there's some horrific thing, more horrific than fucking Andrew. <laughs> oh like, yeah, yeah. Gallivanting with Epstein, like yeah. I don't see it. I think people. Firstly, people, the status quo is just so powerful. You know what I mean? Like, as soon as you have to actually do something, government is literally designed not to do anything. Well, just think about being prime minister, how, like, yeah. ox it would be yeah. to be like, yeah, we're out, peace. And, and at least if you're too. Jamaica, you can pull the whole post-colonial card and the, the race card. And there are other directions you can go. Whereas in Canada, we can't really do in that the UK, as much. UK, like, what else have they got? If not for the crown, that's literally it's the United Kingdom. It's in the they name. don't have an empire anymore. That's what would for, they be for called? Sure. The United Republic. Yo, you're Do they right. Even have a man. Name? Great Britain. I think you just revert to Great Britain at that point. Okay, yeah, that's true. Eh, it doesn't have the same ring because then you have Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and then it's like, are you going to lose Northern Ireland? Are you going to lose Scotland? Oh my God! So you can't even call it Great Britain. If you England. Lose Scotland, you have the English football team. Oh That's it. God. That's what's left after this fire yeah. sale of British institutions. I think if you think about it, do people actually want to go for that? David Beckham, King of England. How do you feel about that? Eh, maybe you know. I guess. Yeah, I guess it will be the posh pre- spice. Yeah, Queen Consort. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I guess the more you think about it, the more complicated and convoluted. And usually, I'm a person. I'm. I'm. And I'm. In favor, in most cases, of um, dissolution and like devolution, devolution. like bringing things down to a lower level, like local power. It's just uniquely in the UK's perspective, like literally their whole concept is the kingdoms uniting. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's been like that for for freaking a thousand years. Yeah. (laughs) You know? And the Welsh have been integrated into this system nice. Like the Welsh. So Wales is like a country in this whole like UK they all, system. They're all countries. But it's basically been yeah. a part of England for 700 years. It's and they still have their own cleansed. language. Yeah. They have their own culture. But you're right. There's been a certain degree of ethnic cleansing. And most people don't even speak Welsh anymore. They just speak English with a yeah. Welsh accent. Yeah. So, you know, if you dissolve the United Kingdom, like what? Wales is just going to be a fucking full-fledged country and they're going to have a fucking Russian embassy and shit? Yeah. Like, that would be unbelievable. They're from buying oil from the Saudis. Like, and you I make it a republic but keep the kingdoms and just have it like America where it's like you have the Welsh state and the the Scottish 
state. Is America the model for the abolition yeah, of the monarchy? So. <laughs> but you can't, yeah. I, I, I don't just don't know. see how that'd be any better. If anything, there'd be more division than unity, you know? Yeah, you're right. So You're absolutely right. And the, the Scottish are already trying to dip and join the EU anyway. Yeah, so... so. Like I'd love to talk with like a Republican in that in sort of an anti monarch kind of sense. I guess you sort of are, but someone who's very strong. But I'm a soft Republican. Yeah, like, I I don't like. Well, anyway, we I'd love to talk to like a hard Republican about this to see what really is. Firstly, how could it work feasibly, and what are the real benefits of this that we're not? Well, there's an out. element of personal psychology in here too, of yeah. like kind of resentment, and you know, oh. Yeah, she was born a princess and I was born a pauper. Yeah. Like there's some it's of that the too. Surface level, so yeah. you have to realize that like, yeah, but they're born into be like life in a fishbowl. And who cares if they have a fancy teacup? Like, yeah. do you really want to live that life? Yeah. Because I'm way too private a person. I would fall to pieces as, as that's a like, monarch. There, that's a good point. There is the humanitarian angle for for abolition in the sense that like Harry <laughs> yeah. Harry in the Oprah yeah. interview was saying that his his brother his family is trapped. That's completely true. That yeah. is true. They are trapped. But then it's like, wait a second. Now I had the thought: if you went on TV, you went on national TV, said that your brother and your father are trapped in this institution, and yet you just let your father give your kids royal titles, trapped. Yeah. In oh my God. Whoa. Mind blown, man. That's actually a really good realization. So is he That's quality man? content right there. Or bullshitting that I don't know. But Harry. it's Oprah. Like Oprah's not the show you go on to tell the truth. No offense to Oprah. <laughs> yeah. It's but true. O- Oprah's the show that you go on to sell a narrative yeah, to right. suburban American women. Yeah. Um, you don't go on there to fucking spill your secrets. Yeah. Uh, you know, you go there to jump up and down on You're the couch. You're selling the brand. You're selling the brand. Yeah. You're Katie Holmes and Tom cruising it. Yeah. But it's like, I used to like Harry a lot. He was the fun prince. I used to like Oprah a lot. You know, so. He was the fun prince. And he was the cool prince. And he was the war hero prince. Yeah. You know. Um, I thought it was cool that he went to Iraq. Yeah, him like, you know, <laughs> yeah, out the mic. Yeah, like, the, just, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that was cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think the military tradition in the royal family is actually one of the cooler things about 100%. the royal family. How like they they all pretty much serve, you know what I mean? Yeah, and that almost that unites them with the most because it's usually the stereotype is the most working class families. I don't know if it's similar in the UK. Oh, very much so. Yeah, you know what I mean? That end up serving, you know? Very much so. So it it just unites them with their subjects even more that they all do military service. You know? Well, ironically, the monarchy's kind of a working class institution. One hundred percent. Yeah. Because not only are they working their whole lives, and yes, they have nice stuff, and they have butlers and secretaries and blah blah blah. Yeah. But they're working their whole lives. Um, so there's there's that angle. Then there's the fact that they don't really, you know go to university and think that they're going to be a professional no. and blah, blah, blah. No, they're born into this system yeah. and they just have to kind of get by just like the working classes. Yeah, like fucking, you know, Harry did his service. He was like a, Harry, I mean, William was like a helicopter search and rescue pilot. Yep. And then he did that for a few years and then he just went on to do, you know, ribbon cutting and like the charitable kind of work and stuff. Moved you know into I mean? the full-time working royal. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, they all have, like, gigs almost. You know what I mean? Yeah, he was, like, uh, I think coaching youth football part-time. And yeah. Stuff like, you know, like Doug, uh, uh, Rob Ford. Yeah, Getting exactly. out with the kids playing football. If anything, you know? the royals invented the gig economy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Like, that they go to these ribbon cuttings, these ceremonies. You know, Kate fucking hosted, like, a Christmas extravaganza last year. Like... These are different gigs that are part of the job. It's not a singular thing. Yeah. Like the monarch has a singular constitutional function, which is basically to like oversee parliament, appoint a prime minister. And that's pretty much it. Other than that, it's just finding stuff to do. (laughs) But I mean, you spend the rest of your time like raising funds for cancer research and meeting disabled children. Opening train stations. They dedicated the Elizabeth line. That was oh one of the wow! Last that she did, yeah. Wow. In, in in London, yeah. Wow, that's cool. So, like, yeah, imagine riding that train right oh, now. Oh man, you know, uh, are we gonna have a highway, the the King's Way now? Like, Ooh. there's so much stuff. Anyway, yeah. um, yeah, and even I guess the last thing I wanted to touch on with this is, 
I was telling my mother about this. I really hope that we don't completely try to erase this history or do away with it. Even if we abolish the monarch somehow, like just the statues. Like it broke it broke my soul during the quote unquote summer of love when you saw fucking you know the statues of Victoria and Elizabeth coming down. They're still taking down Victoria's statues. And Elizabeth statues. And it's like <sighs> It just doesn't make any sense to me, regardless of what they represented. The idea, because the, the argument that they'll say is, oh, they belong in a museum. And it's like, well, that's not the point. The point is this land right here, it's, it's a marker of, it's in your face. It's supposed to be, you're supposed to be confronted with it. Because the, the, I could see the other argument about how, like, you know, for indigenous people, seeing symbols of the crown is traumatizing. For black people, the Confederate flag is, is traumatizing, but it's like, but that's the whole point. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're supposed to be confronted with these things. No, you're not wrong. And reflect like, on it. Yeah. You know, good or bad. Like, whenever I see a statue, I want to go and read it and read yeah. on it. And it doesn't mean that we condone these people. Like, maybe initially it was meant to, like, commemorate them. But I think a more modern interpretation could be like, hey, I just don't think it's a solution to just throw them in a museum or something or in a box. Yeah. You know I mean, for some reason, now as a society, anything that makes us even remotely uncomfortable is seen as bad. Because anything that might make someone emotionally uncomfortable, yeah, definitely makes shareholders uncomfortable. Yeah. So that's kind of the start of it, and that's where you see all of this environmental, social governance, uh, social corporate responsibility, diversity, inclusion, equity. All of that stuff is basically coming out of that. Like if we just run the squeakiest clean. You know, family is friendly, sanitized, LGBTQ, BLM. But then when are we going to have to pay for the sanitizer? If we're na- renaming the streets after modern day people and then that person gets canceled. Yeah, well, it's a never it's like, ending cycle. So it's like, just keep the name. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? No, I, I, t- I totally agree, man. You're not going to face any disagreement from me. I don't, I don't think we're doing our children a service exactly. by destroying this history and preventing them from encountering it the way we encountered exactly. it. Exactly. And confronting the implications ourselves. Because it's, it's part of character building. Like, I sound old here, but it's a crucial part of character building in my life where, you know, you read up on a person, you're like, oh, they did this, they did that. You know what I mean? But yet we're celebrating them. Oh, let me think about that, you know? Yeah. That has a yeah. lot more impact than me being confronted with this person from a statue on the street or a flag that's flying versus just seeing it in some museum that most people won't even see. You know what I mean? It forces it to be part of our everyday life because these figures, for better or worse, shaped our everyday life. It's like the whole Time Magazine thing, you know, Mm. naming Hitler person of the year. Yeah. And if they did something like that, you know. Well, if they did that now, everyone would freak out. Like, imagine naming Vladimir Putin. Person of the he year. should be person of the year. But it's going to be Zelensky. Oh. <laughs> I'm calling it right now, okay? It it's what? Putin and Zelensky. Today is September 10th. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. Really, though, and September 9th, mentally. Yeah. I'm calling it Zelensky time person of the year. You heard it oh, here first. 100%. Yeah. And, like, I guess that would be fair. But, like, back in the day, you know, when they had Hitler, Stalin, all, you know, they right. might have given it to Mao at one point. It wasn't to, like, it wasn't an award. It no was a recognition that this person had the most. Well, impact it would be like if you gave someone an award for being the most Googled man of the year. Exactly. That doesn't mean that like he's Andrew amazing. Tate. Yeah, exactly. You know like I mean? Andrew Tate or Donald Trump yeah. or whomever, right? Some Trump was person of the year when he won. Oh, it was pretty good for time. Time basically became like a decrepit liberal oh, rag 100%. under the they Trump gave administration. It to Joe Biden and Kamala. Oh my God. Well, that was shameful too, but I'm talking about time generally because yeah. at the time I was still curious enough. I was still listening to the time produced podcasts and whatever. Yeah. And I was still trying to scrape what little like historical content they had now. left. It's a fucking rag, man. It's so sad. Yeah. Yet another institution falling before our eyes. Actually, okay. So again, is there I'm, any that are left? Because in Canada, we at the very least have the National Post. Yeah, you know what I mean. Which does have its moments of being a squalid little rag every now and again, but at least you still got Rex and you still got Lord Tubby. Yeah, and that's what keeps me coming back. So in America, do they have any other than I guess there's the there's the New York Post, which yeah, which is actually the storied, reviewed 
revered, not revered, but it's one of the oldest newspapers in America. Yeah. People don't realize that because it's so associated with like. With like a so commuter, and, like populist yeah. right wing paper almost. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess there's a New York Post. I wouldn't really, would you call them like uh, prestige? No, it's not prestige tell. journalism. So, yeah, it's what, like kind of tabloid Which prestige journalist paper hasn't gone full just corporate? Whoa. I can't think of the LA Times. People say the LA Times is not that bad. Really? I don't know if I believe that, but I've heard that. I don't obviously read the LA Times that regularly. I've definitely read columnists in the LA Times who were pretty good. And I've read people who were syndicated by the LA Times who were pretty Mm. good. So I'd be willing to say the LA Times is probably as close as it gets. But as far as East Coast, like traditional America, like 13 colonies, like no, we got nothing. Waffle, no. New York Times, no. Boston Herald, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Probably not. Like, yeah. Considering Massachusetts, even something like sixty minutes, which was like kind of like a boring kind of like, you know what I mean? Like, but show. boring in the honorable way. Even <laughs> back that, when boredom represented integrity journalistically. Lady, I think her name is Leslie Stahl. Just picking dumb fights with Trump in the twenty twenty oh, election. Where once again they did the Piers Morgan before Piers Morgan, where they're like he walked. They off. faked the walkout. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. And then Trump BS. dropped the footage and it showed that no, he did the interview. I was just like, yeah, the time's done. You know what I mean? Let's get Mike Pence in here. Let's keep it moving. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's just all these institutions. So the back to the monarchy thing. That's why this needs to be preserved because it's the one institution that they can't touch. At yeah, least not yet. You're right. That they can't completely just um, pave over. Well, it's the foundation of the house. And you can redo the foundation, but... It's a lot harder. It's the hardest thing to do in the whole house. It's much easier to just, you know, I don't know, redo the basement or something. Yeah. Instead of redoing the whole foundation. And, And in our system, constitutionally speaking, I mean, you know, again, people trace the lineage of, like, Canadian constitutional law, if you want to put it that way, back to 1215, the Magna Carta, and King John, and the Barons, right? Yeah. So we have 800 plus years of common law, legal precedent, and, like, policy precedent and institutional precedent. Yeah. Now... My question kind of generally is, at what point is the conservative thing, small c, um, to rebuild the institutions, blow them up, build parallel institutions, whatever. At what point does that preserve the status quo more than maintaining the failing institutions that we already have as a society? Wait, by turning it up and... Like, I'm sorry, that's a huge question. It's very broad, but I I will reiterate. So people say that, you know, the the conservative against small c, not really talking about politics so much here, but the conservative position is to maintain our institutions, strengthen our institutions, make sure that our institutions are acting in the public interest, right? But at what point do our institutions as a society become so compromised that we got to just blow it up and start again and then that actually becomes the conservative position because what you're conserving at that point is the integrity and the oh, health okay. and the dignity of your whole society i've heard that rather it's, than simply some of the underpinning it's institutions. the argument of like basically you know people wanted trump to um break up big tan or like kind of get rid of section 230 whatever it's called mm. you know what i mean whereas the traditional conservative opinion would just be they're free, they're in the, they're private companies, you know what yeah, I mean? Let them yeah, do whatever yeah. they want. But no, in this case, the conservative position is these private companies are attacking free speech, so we need to step in as a government and help preserve that. Or um, the alternative, or another um, position like that would be, um, fuck, I had another good example. Section 230 is a good example, though, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a very or good example. Or the COVID, the COVID mandates, like DeSantis mm. kind of banning people or businesses from implementing COVID or schools from implementing COVID mandates. Whereas Doug Ford kind of is just like, when they, when they lifted them, they were like, you know, yeah, schools aren't supposed to like implement mass mandates, right, but they yeah. did anyways. Kenny said the same thing to Andrew Lawton. Yeah. Andrew Lawton was like, why are you keeping the passport system if you're scrapping the passports? And Kenny was like, well, I do think businesses you know, the conservative argument is that businesses have a right to and it's, do whatever no, they the want. The real conservative argument is you're trying to conserve freedom. And to do that, you need to 
put your foot down and be like, no, mm. you can't do this. So this is where I become a little bit of a libertarian and I have to show my libertarian phase. Yeah. Because I, I always lean in that direction. Oh, I too. don't I'm like going to the whip hand. Yeah. Like I'm at a all. Big libertarian. Yeah. Like I'm willing to do it, but it's not at all how I But sometimes I'm you have to. You're right. You know, you yeah. have to. Yeah. Sometimes you do have to make the pragmatic. Yeah. sacrifice basically yeah rather than simply live and die by your own principles and get trounced indefinitely so you're right yeah uh and, and that's always a whole can of worms in and of itself i guess but sorry i don't mean to derail us here with these kinds of massive yeah. questions but anyway what's the original point <laughs> no i was just curious as to what you thought about oh yeah to to, to break it all up to preserve it if it's necessary. What is the conservative option and why? And you don't have to answer that like directly, but uh, monarchy is one example. Yeah. But even like common law itself, yeah. the constitution, the charter of rights and freedoms, yeah. all of this historical precedent, I don't know. But anyway, it's a Honestly, broad question. We're not gonna answer it now. Yeah, like, I say if it's, if it's deemed necessary, the constitution, I think we should definitely look at it. I know it's, Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm kind of hypocritical by saying that, I think it's more worthy, it's a more worthy pursuit to open up the can of worms of the Constitution than it is the monarchy. I agree. Well, you can't really do one without the other, but I, I Well, no, fundamentally you can blow up the Constitution and just get the monarch to sign off on whatever the... I guess you're right. I guess That's what right. I'm saying. Yeah. I'd rather blow up the Constitution So what, keep what's the, the argument there, that Quebec not signing it makes it invalid and we're starting again? Sort of, but more so that... Clearly, these politicians are able to just wipe their ass of it. Well, that's the thing. Like, the Canadian <laughs> Constitution clause. has failed. It has failed the people. It has failed Canadians. Isn't that section the two? Charter of Rights and Freedoms has failed Canadians. It's crazy. It's, it's sad because Brian Peckford, right? Yeah, oh, my He's God. The I, one, I the feel. Signatory who's taking the government to court for violating it. God bless that man. And I'm very doubtful that it will go anywhere, no, honestly. No, they're just going to hush him up. These judges Remember, are just no so one would cut. talk to Peckford. He requested, like, every yes. media organization, and he had he had to go on Peterson. Yes. Because no one else would talk to him. Yes. And this guy is the last living signatory. He was the like, premier of Newfoundland. Is this right? the game in Canada? If anyone makes sense, you just blacklist them, force them to go on Peterson so that they can become Red Skull Marvel villains Pretty in some much. Olivia Wilde movie? Yeah. Like the fact that our own judicial system doesn't respect it, or else this would have been challenged. That's so shamefully. Yeah, you know, like the unconstitutional, you know, arrive can whatever mandates. Like, we need to blow it up, man. Yeah, we do. We do. You know. You're right. Abolish the notwithstanding clause. Yes. You know. Yes. Like, whose idea? Why was... can't the wait? Couldn't Daniel Smith just pull in the notwithstanding clause on Alberta sovereignty? Hmm. Could the federal government actually, like, do they have a move to counter that? I don't know if they do. I don't do. think so. That's a good point. Now, uh, anyway, that's yeah, a whole other thing. Yeah. I guess, so we've been at it for at least. Oh, my God. Like, oh, two hours, practically. An hour, hour Oh, my God. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> the, I'm, I'm going to signpost the end here a little bit. Mm -hmm. We still haven't talked about Christia Freeland. Yeah, considering running for NATO secretary. So this means I, I have to update the liberal power rankings because yeah. Freeland is no longer the heir apparent if she's going to run for NATO sec gen, right? And it shows that at least before the queen died, she was kind of looking at the lib as a sinking ship. Because like, why else wouldn't she want it? She, she could have been prime minister. She wanted to be easy. She know? can Paul Martin her way in like no yeah. problem. Yeah. So the fact that she's even considering leaving means that it's a sinking ship. Everyone knows it. And are we just looking at again rearranging the, the coronation the of Pierre Polyev? Like, is that what we're looking at here? Yeah. Is is Cash? I almost called her Catherine McKenna. Is Christia Freeland? Yeah. Going to dip and freaking just let the Polyev era happen without her? Yeah. I guess it would be smart. You know what I mean. So the other thing here too, and I don't want to harp on this too too much, but she is Ukrainian Canadian, as we yeah. all know. And um, obviously, he's probably more interested in the Ukraine conflict than she is in running Canadian fucking... domestic policy. Yeah. Uh, so her running for NATO sec gen makes sense. Yeah. This thing, yeah, she's not even foreign minister anymore. She's the finance minister. But it's like, 
you could just tell from any of the speeches, the different lunches that she goes to, she talks more about climate change in this country's <laughs> finances. She talks about climate change in Ukraine more than anything to do with finances. Yeah. You know what I mean? She's not interested what one bit in the financial affairs of this fucking country. And neither is the prime minister. Yeah, so I don't blame her. So this, I guess, is the argument for Bill Morneau's revenge, 420. I guess so. And or Mark Carney. Yeah. But anyway, we're, we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. This would be probably the lead story on yes, any other episode. So literally. the fact that we're only getting to this now after, what, 105 minutes? Yeah. That is a testament to how important and monumental and revered... Uh, Queen Elizabeth II was. Okay, next quick hit, quick hit. Okay. Candace Bergen retiring. Right. Says she won't seek re-election after the new leader is named. Candace Bergen, Bob Ray, and Rona Ambrose yeah. are the three greatest interim leaders. Oh, for sure. Of our generation. Yeah. Because they all almost overshadowed the person. Absolutely. It's, it's yet to be seen with Candace, but the last two overshadowed. Like, I remember Bob Ray way better than I remember Stefan Dion. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, obviously, there's a lot of other history there and exactly. baggage, and especially being from Ontario and all that. But yeah. still, like, anyway. Yeah. Um, Ambrose. They're punching way above their weight, you know? Ambrose was, yeah. Prime Minister material. She was. Bob Ray, too, honestly. Bob Ray, too. I don't yeah. th- if we got Bob Ray instead of Justin. <laughs> oh, that would have been so much better. Yeah. Like, I'm sure you have a lot of the same. I don't know how much woke he, how much would he lean into woke? Maybe Quite a bit. Yeah. But less so probably it would have at least been a more intellectually credible version of the party whereas now the liberals don't even pretend to be intellectually credible their version of intellectual credibility is like bureaucratic elitism because he bob ray wouldn't have just expelled all the fucking french and martin people like yeah did yeah he sent fucking joe mccallan to china (laughs) yeah fucking stefan dion he purged all the remaining catholics from the party (laughs) for the (laughs) pro-life issue yeah exactly like literally purged he he went full like who was lady mao's name yeah yeah i don't don't, don't remember her her name unfortunately but yeah she yeah Literally, that's what he did. Yeah, to the Liberal Party, pretty much of anyone who wasn't a Trudeau loyalist. It, it was like, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So, any Candace Bergen. Yep, she's out, and she did a fabulous job. She took control of the party at a terrible time for the party historically. Yeah. After Aaron Wet Blanket O'Toole had almost single-handedly destroyed conservatism in Canada as a project. And they're in the middle of the convoy. They're in the middle of the convoy, and you can only imagine how nervous somebody else would have been to have taken the moral position there. Party literally could have split apart. If if O'Toole had been the leader during the convoy. Dude, yeah. The parties we know it could have ceased to exist. Yeah, it'd come to a boiling point if he somehow managed to hold on. But the the could. mass exodus to the PPC would have been hopefully quite unbelievable. Yeah. Yes, but she was that steady hand. the The messaging yep. was steady concise. hand on the tiller. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. we 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 are with the people who are peacefully protesting. We're against the unlawful blockade of bridges and critical infrastructure were against violence and hate speech. She took the generic conservative position and like the best way. Yeah. And that's her job as interim leader. It's yes. not to pop off on Twitter. Yeah. But she took the conservative position and she did it in the best way possible. Mad respect for her. You know what I mean? I, I give her an A. Once again, I'm sad that she can't run. It's just, I thought when I saw her retiring, another longly held conservative tradition of a fully capable female leader not being the leader. That's right. The Tories <laughs> have had two very capable female interim leaders lately. Very easily yeah. could have been prime minister, but not because they're better than politics, because of course they are, you know? They're, yeah. You know, so I wish her the best, but it's going to be sad. I was really hoping she would like stick on around as like a deputy, deputy prime minister. Deputy, yeah. Or you know? It, it's a loss for Polyev or whoever wins. That's the thing. Because having Bergen around and having her support and gravitas, and she's been around a long time. But I don't blame her, honestly. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you know, you move on with your life too, right? Yeah. Like, who wants to sit in that, you know, dingy ass House of Commons for their whole adult life? Yeah, she could come back. She, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, be a senator or an ambassador or yeah. whatever. Next quick hit. Okay. Education Stephen Lidche oh, right. is yeah. base. He says yep. schools, so he's the education minister in Ontario, says schools will not be closed due to possible spike in COVID-19 infections. And I really hope we don't get <laughs> the amount of times. Like, but honestly, 
you know what I mean? Like in your column, you know what I mean? Like we got to like tell it how it is. Yeah. So let's tell yeah. it. What do you think? Is he the most based? No, I'm saying it. He's Recently, the most yes. based Doug Ford cabinet minister. Recently, yes. 100%. 100%. Way more base than Doug. Or Since like Elliott last spring, or, yeah, at least. Yeah. When basically they stopped giving so much of a shit about sabotaging Ontario schools. Yeah, him and fucking Dr. Dr. Kieran Moore. Yes. Dude, Dr. Kieran Moore yes. might be my favorite Ontario <laughs> right now. Like, he's been on fire lately. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, talk about how you only have to, you don't even have to do the five day isolation anymore. Just come home, go back to work. We don't have symptoms. All these different things. It's stuff that they should have done, like the school thing. They should have done that from September of 2020. The kids should have gone back to school, and that's it. Oh, but the teachers' unions (laughs) threw a two year long hissy fit. Yes. The fact, like, my younger brother, he's like 11. Like, he, the amount of school. The amount of days he was in oh my school God. in the past two years, I could count on my hands. Yeah. I'm not even exaggerating. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's sad. They fucked up these kids' lives yep. for two years. Yep. University, kids are going back in person, and fucking Western still wants to, like, mandate them. Yep. Yep. It's ridiculous. So at least... Careful, Peter. You're going to get us pulled off YouTube again. I hope we get... No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, like, the fact that, like, someone has some balls. This education minister who... To his to to his respect, he's been the most resilient cabinet minister, provincial yeah. or federally. Yeah. Teachers union was coming at his neck. He there are rumors that he wanted to be moved out of the post before the last election because he is worried about teachers union targeting his riding and then mm. he somehow managed to win. I wonder what his Well the teachers was. unions, they've been out for Doug Ford's scalp for like five Day years one, now. Yeah. And I have to admit that was part of why I was so bullish on the Ford government early on, mm-hmm. um, because uh, you know the teachers' unions were screaming bloody murder, and he was actually fighting back. Oh, it wasn't even close in his. Writing. Oh wow, what a trouncing! Yeah, fifty-seven percent of the vote to twenty-eight percent for the liberal. <laughs> New Blue got half the NDP support. This is in King Vaughn. <laughs> New Blue, really? Yeah. NDP almost oh, yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Damn. There's a moderate party? They're not really a thing. <laughs> what do you mean? They don't really exist. <laughs> like, they make New Blue look like a serious party. Oh, really? <laughs> and I, I say this as someone who actually voted New Blue and was yeah. happy to do so, yeah. simply to punish the Ford conservatives for two years of bullshit. Yeah, I voted Ontario Party for that similar reason. Because the New Blue guy in my writing dropped out. Yeah, and there was no Ontario Party guy in my writing, so yeah. I didn't even have to make up my mind. Yeah, but anyways... Props to Steve and Lecce for having the balls to, you know, stick to some sort of... He's actually the least liberal member of the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party right yeah. now. Because they've kicked out all of the actual conservatives. Yeah. The fucking edge. And honestly, maybe he's sticking around potential leadership. Yeah, maybe. This I mean, honestly, at this point, yeah. who are you supporting instead of him? Yeah. I'm support. I, I don't know. I'd support Baber. Yeah, but he's got, he's not even a member of the party anymore. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. He could no, come it's, back. It's possible. No, imagine a Baber, Leche. Guys, I was right on these issues from day one. So now it's time to get it right two years too that's late. That's Baber? That, this, that's my Baber impression. Liche, if Baber came back like that. Yeah. That, that would, anyway. And Leche would be like, um, I don't know, maybe like the Hillary... It's like mm. kind of Hillary versus Obama, where Obama was always like anti-Iraq. He voted against the Iraq War. He was and, anti-Iraq War until he became president. <laughs> yeah, and Hillary was like, "Yes, I voted for the war, but like I did it because of this, and you know what I mean." But now I've seen the light. That I did be it Liche. because of all those good union jobs and all those munitions factories. Yeah, that would be Leche, where he'd have to try and position himself, like pretty much tie himself to the good Ford legacy mm. points. Pretty much he'd take credit for the post-COVID Ford government and try to distance yeah. himself from the dream. Yeah. And the pre, you know? What yeah. I mean? Yeah, I can definitely see that. So you try to tap and but I think he'd be able to do a good job. He yeah. Of that. Like yeah. he'd give Baber or anyone else, anyone from like the quote unquote hard right faction, 
a run for their money. I think. No, you're probably right, especially with the benefit of institutional support from the party, which he would definitely have against Roman Baker. So I'm putting, maybe we should do a Tory leadership, like an Ontario Tory leadership power ranking, because I have... Honestly, we should do every party in the country. Baber. <laughs> do this to Eventually. Leave. Eventually. Because we have Baber, um, Liche, I, I think Caroline, Caroline is in the mix. Oh, man. She has to be the heir apparent yes. from, from Big Tory. Yes. She has to be. 100%. Because she's had some several key kind of portfolios like trans, transportation. I don't know what she's doing now, but she's had a bunch of portfolios and she's managed Attorney to... Attorney General. Yeah. She's managed to avoid controversy for the most part. Like... Only time I hear about her in the news is when they're like opening like a train station or something, <laughs> which is good. Yeah, that is that's exactly what like I want from a transportation to, like, minister. She's managed to completely avoid any sort of like pandemic related, you know. You're actually so right. It's baggage. weird how quiet Carolyn's been since 2018. But she's also been visible. She's like been visible, but quiet. visible, but qu seen, but not heard. Exactly. Oh man, which that's the winning perfect. formula, she's dude. A, she's the minister of transportation and the minister of francophonie affairs. That's a good, uh, good portfolio for her. Yeah. So I, I think those are solid. Yeah. Like, I think she's nice. one of the front runners, yeah. Um, who else? I, it would have been like the Carahelios. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but they kind of blew their wad a little bit. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I can't, don't really. Is Vic Fideli still in there? Oh, definitely. I can't believe we didn't come up with that sooner. Yeah. Vic Fideli has to, excuse me, Vic Fideli has Just to be on the, the short list. You'd be like, what would be a good analogy for him? Like, he's like Mitch McConnell, but like not as old and not as warped. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know. Because he's still like a mainstream kind of a party guy, but you know, he's a real conservative. He's a northern guy. He's not like a total sellout. Yeah. But yeah. he's still definitely like a fixer kind of within the party, mm -hmm. interim leader guy. Like, you know, there's a lot of angles with Vic Fideli. But yeah, like a Fideli, Mulroney, Baber, Leke campaign would actually mm -hmm. be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, We've called Stephen Lecce, Lecce, Lecce. We've called him every possible permutation of yeah. that name at this point. It is 2.20 a.m. I'm okay. so tired. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know if there's anything. At the bottom we have, what's a more worthy pursuit? Destroy the Liberal Party or save the Liberal Party? But I think that's going to be like another 20-minute conversation. Dude, that would be like so a 10-year conversation. So I might like could go on that one that. for a long time. It oh. Also, it's a question of who's doing the saving. Is it Jody High Roller, Wilson yeah. Raybould? Or? Last thing, this, and literally only two minutes because I'm about okay. to like pass Oh, out. yes, Bernard Shaw. Bernard Shaw died too. So he died, like, he is a famous, um, he's the CNN, um, like, the first chief anchor from, like, 1980 when CNN started. Literally helped found the network. He died on September 7th, the day before the Queen. But does anybody care? Sadly, not even CNN cared because you told me that it was only on the ticker yes. and it was like a blink and you'll miss it thing. So like yes. your mom, who is watching the same show as you, didn't even see it on the ticker. Yeah, and that's literally how I found out from the ticker. Yeah, that's crazy, <laughs> man. CNN. I didn't even see anything, any Google alerts about it or anything. Well, okay, what if, what if you know, God forbid, but what if Mansbridge died the same day as Prince Charles? What would yeah. the CBC do? Yeah. Same thing CNN did. I, this is terrible, and I really don't mean this in a morbid way, but I kind of hope that happens now. <laughs> I just want to see what our public broadcaster would do. That's all. The same thing, man. They always go for whatever leads it leads, and the royal blood. Yeah, leads. royal blood trumps Reiner. man's bridge blood, I guess. Yeah. Just ask Wendy Mesley. You know what I mean? Yeah. And no, it's that's like, true. I don't know much about Bernard Shaw because he was a bit before my generation, but he seemed like the kind of one of the last kind of traditional like the, the cronkite generation Mike wall is you know what i mean where these these news anchors weren't obsessed with being fucking twitter anti-trump celebs yeah <laughs> yeah twitter reply guys this is the pre-don lemon era of cnn yeah. it was a more dignified time you know what yeah. I mean? a more civilized age <laughs> Yeah. So I don't think he minds. <laughs> you know what I mean? He probably understands. Well, he was a newsman. Yeah. So he'd exactly. probably get it. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. The Queen scooped him. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, could be worse. Yeah. So, and I guess with that, you know, 
<laughs> wrap up. So yeah, we'll yeah, yeah. So our uh, our video on the Western U uh, Vax mandate got pulled from YouTube because I I clickbaited the title just a little bit too hard. I think mm. you know saying it's time to declare victory. Yeah. The censors didn't like that. We're gonna keep trying to upload stuff to YouTube. We're moving to Rumble. I might start uploading stuff on BitChute. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. But uh, continue to follow us, like, and subscribe. We need to get better at. Yeah, like, we need calls to, to, to promote this shit. With calls to action. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So smash that like button. Yeah. And Hammer that subscribe hit, button. Hit the bell, and you'll be automatically notified of yeah. our content. Follow us on Pennant Inc. You have all of our written work. That's I N K Pennant. Yeah. Dot I-N-K. There's um There's Twitter. Uh, Twitter, Pennant Inc. Yeah. The other social media aren't really active yet. We're no, still I'm still on. figuring that out. I'm yeah. terrible at social media. Um I'm I'm you know, a quiet private person. Yeah. I'm learning. Uh but it, it is a bit of a struggle for me, I will admit. It's a work in progress. But we're but, getting there, and yeah. the sooner you guys subscribe and like and share and retweet and reblog and TikTok, the sooner we can stop talking about it. Yeah. So do that, and I just like to say, you know, regardless of everything we talked about, I really am just happy to be alive today and happy to, like, just share in this moment. You know, despite how sad it is, it's important that we kind of reflect. And I encourage everyone to, you know, spend time with their family, spend time with your loved ones, go out and do something with your friends, and just reflect on being in this moment and being alive and being with your loved ones. And just reflect on everything that Her Majesty the Queen, you know, gave us and did for us and represented and encouraged and helped us to just completely hold on. And, you know, her quote, maybe I will end this off with um, reading her, um, her, her, um, her COVID speech quote, you know, the whole... Um, While you look that up, I'm yeah. just going to say as well... As you're seeing all of these, you know, mean tweets and dancing on the grave and dabbing on colonialism and all that shit, take her example in mind. Keep it in mind. Imagine how she would react to that. Would she be baited into an angry altercation and telling these people that, oh, you're a disrespectful, anti-patriotic, blah, blah, blah. No. She would smile, her dignified smile. She would more or less understand where they were coming from, and she would move the heck on. And, uh, you know, that's also what you guys should do. So oh, right. don't don't take the bait. There's a lot of bait out there right now. Just don't take it. Take the high ground. It's what she would want. I'll read an, expert for, an excerpt from um, her speech that she gave on April 5th, 2020, as the world was um, beginning its kind of global lockdown and the two years of hell and all this kind of shit. But she gave, I, I, I recommend everyone after this video is done to go and watch that speech the Queen's coronavirus speech in full because it's probably the single best speech given by any kind of world leader I've ever seen given. Wow. And there's a lot of good speeches, but I think at the time when I watched it, it's what I needed to hear. It's what a lot of people mm. needed to hear. No one articulated just the common anxiety of the world so well. Mm. And the quote that I have is one of my favorite quotes of all time that I'll always keep in my heart is, she says, Her Majesty says, we should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We'll be with our friends again. We'll be with our families again. We will meet again. The Queen. And um, she was right. You know what I mean? For two years, we were doing things virtually. We were locked up inside. Here we are maskless outside together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Doing things, communing, living, loving. So take it from the queen. She was right, of course. We were with our friends again. We meet again. And this is Alex and Peter for the Pet Up Podcast signing off. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. Honestly, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. And let us know what you think. And we will meet you again in the next episode. God save the queen. Long live the queen. Long live, bless her soul, and long live the king. Good night. <laughs> we should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. 
We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. But for now, I send my thanks and warmest good wishes to you all.